Um, I've used it, used it a lot, so we're doing a great talk on Goliath Gel and a bit of support about COVID-19 and um, also the providing a service and how to how to go about that. That'd be great later on. We've got a packed agenda, um, but just a, a few reminders. So um, none of the panellists, including myself, can see or hear any of you. Um, any questions that you have, make sure that you use the Q&A button. You'll be able to see at the bottom of your screen, um, it says Q&A. So if you have any questions for any of the speakers, uh, just make sure you pop it in there. We do have a chat section also. Now, it's really, really important that this chat section is only used if you have technical issues. Um, one of my colleagues is keeping an eye on that just to see if anybody does, then hopefully he can help out or, or deal with anything that we're having a problem with and maybe jump in. But just remember when the speakers are on, um, we'll do, they'll do questions at the end, Q&A at the end, um, and the only way they better see those um, questions are through the Q&A chat. Really, really important, okay? Um, as I said, um, we, we won't, the speakers won't be using the chat button, so they won't better see anything that you put in there. Um, any of you, um, CPD, if you provided a CPD number, your points will automatically be allocated. So, you know, have a check afterwards, give it a, a day or two, and then just have a check on your account, make sure those points have appeared there. And any problems, obviously, contact the, the relevant scheme. Um, and again, with in terms of technical issues, um, I mean, I think we're getting used to regional forums and um, using digital platforms for our, our meetings and agendas and training. However, if we do have any technical issues, just bear with us. We will be as quick as possible. And I'm sure you all understand that, you know, sometimes these things can happen. Good stuff. OK, so um, let's get on with the agenda then. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole agenda. You'll all have it there to, to have a look. But uh, without further ado, I'd just like to ask Sarah, Sharon Hughes from Basset to um, unmute and use her camera. She'll have that request coming up in a moment. And Sharon's going to be talking about pulse baiting to save time. Hello, Sharon. Hi. Hi. Hi there. Hi. I'll uh, leave it over to you and I'll, I'll get rid of myself. OK. OK. Right then, I'll share my screen. Right. Can everyone see my presentation? Hello? Yeah, we can, Sharon, as always. Right, okay, really, righty ho, then away I go. Okay, so um, presentation today is on uh, pulse baiting. So let's get straight into it. Right, hang on one second, it's not going page down. There we go, sorry. So these are the contexts that I'll have. So. Um, We'll be going through these quick, um, just a couple of minutes on each one. So um, the surplus baiting and pulse baiting, the two different techniques, how we determine which is which, the, and that's related to the toxicity of the active. So I'll do a bit on that. And um, what we mean by pulse baiting, then um, a few examples of uh, field trials where this was undertaken so you can see how we did it. And then at, at to end with the advantages of pulse baiting. So, for anticoagulants, there are two types of practical baiting techniques. One is surplus, or another name for it is saturation, but I'll call it surplus throughout egg. That's kind of the term I, I use. And the other one is pulse baiting. Now, pulse baiting in the UK is for professional on, only, and in a lot of European countries is, it is. But no matter which method that we use, and obviously these I'll go into more detail, um, it's all um, according to the crew uh, code of practice or equivalent code of practices. So if I just would we'll just go through each of these, what do we mean by them? So starting with surplus baiting. So surplus baiting is for all multiple feed anticoagulants. Um, and that is when the rat or a mouse has to eat more than once um, to, to have eaten enough to kill them for a lethal dose. And to enable this, them to eat this, have for the, enough bait to be available from to eat multiple times to get the lethal dose. Obviously, there has to be surplus in the available to them. So there has to be more than they need to make sure everyone can eat multiple times. Um, and because of this, bait point, it's not that there are more frequent bait points, that's not the case. What tends to happen is that when it's surplus baiting, and I have a table later on to demonstrate this, the bait point sizes tend to be larger. So typically about two 
programs. And it also, um, also again, to make sure there's all, always sub-frequent. So we've I said it was for the multi-feed bait. So uh, which ones are they? So they are all that contain the first generation anticoagulant. So cumatetrol, chlorofacinone, warfarin, they're all multi-feed baits. And the second generation anticoagulants, bromodilone, difenicum, and difethylone. They all come under the, the, the heading of multi-feed, and so therefore surplus baiting is required. So then pulse baiting, that was the second technique. So this is where, a, is this technique is only used when a single feed of the rodenticide can be enough to kill the rodent. Um, and, and that's quite restricted to the number of baits that it is. So they've got to be able to consume a lethal dose in just kind of one feed and hence the single feed. And if it's a single feed or aside, then you can use pulse baiting. And there are only uh, two actives that fall under this category, um, and that's bradyphacum and flacumafen. So for bradyphacum, it's clairat, solo, talon, um, and obviously for flacumafen, it's storm, storm water, things like that. Um, and an advantage kind of not related to baiting technique is also that these are the two molecules as well. These are two of the molecules that are no practical resistance to that and diphthylone from the, the multiple feed. So for pulse baiting, the technique means that because it's more potent, it's less critical that bait is available all the time. So we don't need surplus baiting. So therefore for that, we have less bait per bait point and then less visits to re replenish. Um, and that's the key to it, um, that and the, the pulse of it, which we'll come on to in a, in a few minutes. And it's not related to the physical form of the bait, block, cereal, pasta. So with one of the, the multi-feeds made a super, super palatable um, bait, it's still a multi-feed and still needs to be surplus. So it's not related to the palatability at all. So it's not related to the physical form and it's not related to the palatability. It's solely related to the active ingredient in the bait. And an example, if, if it is, pulse baiting is allowed. So this is just an example of a, a storm ultra label. Um, we, we can see the, the on the instructions pulse baiting. Um, so it will say if you're permitted to do it. Um, so there, there it is. So how do we decide which are multi-feed and which are surplus? So which are surplus, sorry, and which are pulse baiting? So this is down to the to toxicity of the active ingredient. So there is no kind of hard and fast definition of a single feed, but this is kind of how I like to think of it. So this is a graph on the left of rat activity um, throughout the a standard feeding period. So waking up at um, dusk and going back to the nest at dawn. And if we split this up, activity is, is highly related to feeding and foraging. So if we kind of split this up into four, where I've put the circle, I've designated that as rat feeding. So when they wake up, just like us, um, minor feed kind of breakfast, then we can see larger activity. It's kind of a lunch, just trying to be anthropomorphic here. And a middle feed back to the nest for kind of 12 at is going to eat 10% of their body weight, which is what we say. So that's approximately 25 grams. So that means each of these feeds is about six grams. Now, this isn't a casting stone. I mean, a rodent can go to a bait point and love it and eat 
it more or less its whole daily allowance, or it might go and eat a couple of grams. But this is kind of just a, a uh, an example, a, a, a model for how we work, how I, it, it's worked out. So we're saying each feed is approximately six grams. And then if we look at the LD50 table, so all the data we present is in LD50. So that's the lethal dose for the rat to stand a 50-50 chance of dying. And that's what it's always presented as. So the lethal dose, LD50, is in black letters, black numbers down there for each of the actives. And then in brackets is the, the bait concentration that the active comes in. And then in um, brackets is double the LD50. So that means kind of belt and braces, they're bound to die two LD50s. So that's the value in between. And we can see that um, there's, a, there's a big difference. If we look at the LD50s, we can see there's a big difference um, between the first generations and the multi-feed second generations. And then you move on to Bradyphacum and Flacumafin. And this is rat data at the moment. And we can see there's a massive difference in them too. And we can see now how the divide comes between single feed and, and, pulse and multiple feed and hence surplus baiting and pulse baiting. So then we can see that difference. So then how to pulse bait then? With, with that kind of knowledge that this is what we've got, how do we pulse bait? So pulse baiting is based on that we have, in every infestation, there is a hierarchy of um, dominance, subdominance, however many levels. And that these feed in this kind of hierarchical level. And the idea for pulse baiting is that each pulse kills um, a section of that infestation. So it kills a hierarchy of them, that infestation. So we control the infestation in waves or in pulses. So the first pulse is day one, then we have a, a day four pulse, then, then every seven days, so seven, 14, 21, 28, up to 35 if needed. And that's just a pulse of bait. And each pulse will kill um, a proportion of the, the infestation. Now, because it's not surplus baited, it could be that all the bait goes on one pulse. But that's okay. The, the technique allows for that. So this is the principle. The pulses are pulse, pulse, pulse. And to go along with that is kill the, the level, the level, the level of the hierarchy going down like that until eventually, obviously, the infestation is controlled. So this is... Um, kind of a typical graph of what we're, we'd expect with pulse baiting. So I've took here um, 50 grams of the bait point size. So mm. kind of a typical storm, storm ultra type of bait point or, or bradyphacum. And we can see that this is what we'd expect. So it's the beginning of your infestation. So your first day you're pulsing and obviously there's 50, 50 points, 50 grams per bait point, which isn't a lot. And then we go, then the next day we're looking at um, maybe half of that's been eaten. And then the next day, so days three, there's, there's, it's all eaten. So there's nothing there, um, there's nothing in place. But that's okay because that's allowed for. And then on day four, we have a replenishment. So back up to 50 uh, grams per bait point. And then we have the same pattern. So on days, six five six there might be no bait in the environment no bait in the environment or or on the obviously at these bait points and then we go to day seven so now we're on 14 day pulses so four seven day pulses so the next one would be seven then 14. so at day seven now we're expecting the bait to last for longer because we've already controlled some of the infestation so we again 50 grams per bait point, dropping down, dropping down. And then 
by the time we come to day 14, there may well be no bait available. That could have well been eaten. And then on day 14, we do this, the, the next pulse. And then there we see kind of the slower day by day reduction in the number, the amount of bait available until it plateaus off. And it plateaus off, obviously, because that's when we've controlled the infestation, no bait take. So that's kind of a typical pattern for when pulse baiting. So now if we then, then that overlay that with kind of a typical pattern for surplus baiting, we can see that straight away we've got this um, 50 grams versus 200 grams. And with surplus baiting, there is always, as, as the name says, there always has to be bait there available. So we never want this to, um, this no bait available that we get with, that could happen with pulse baiting. So the orange is for the surplus baiting, and we can see the same pattern really. There's a lot at the bait point to begin with, then it decreases, and then we have to replenish, and then we keep replenishing. And but all the time there's always more bait. Replenishment required, high volumes, more replenishment, because we can't have that same situation where there's no bait available to the rodents. And then we get the same pattern where at the end we know we've got control because one of the indices is obviously um, just leveling off of the bait take. So that's graphically a representation of how the two different um, methods, techniques work, what it looks like. So taking that into the field, this is a, a trial that we did did um, pulse baiting uh, its rats in an urban environment and the, it was a, a bar as we can see and so not only did we have the problems of the restaurant but then at the side we can see this is actually the alley at the side of the restaurant which um, lent a lot to be desired and we can see the pulse so what we do I mean the ones that have seen these types of graphs we put up before that, that, that in pale blue is a census and we use that to get an indication because this is a trial that we um, submit to regulators and also we want to prove to ourselves and to the likes of um, yourselves that this is actually working so we do a census and we we place wheat down and monitor take for four consecutive days so that averages about 900 grams so for us we say that's about 90 rats um we use 10 grams of rat. And then we have a lag period. So we, there's no, there's no uh, indication then that we've um, in any way enticed the, the rats to, to feed. So that's 10 days. And then we go in with the, this one, we have the first bait. So that's the take. Then it decreases down to day three and we replenish. So we didn't have to re completely replace. We replenished on day four. And then on day five to seven, so that looks the same, but actually obviously that's three days take. We replenished again, but then after that we got no bait take. And we took this up to day 10 and we still, to make sure we had no bait take. And then we went in with the census diet again, and you can see one, two, three, four days post census, we had no wheat take. So that was one of the indices we used to show that we was using this, we had 100% control and we had the bait placed down for nine days. So this is a um, mice in a rural, and again, it's a storm ultra trial and the same thing. So on the left, we have the pulse baiting, the census before we go into the pulse. Um, and then here we had four pulses here. So a bit slightly longer to control and you can see the typical pattern. So we, we pulsed on day one, then again on day four, then again on day seven, and on 14 and day 14 by this time we're not replacing we're just replenishing and we can see we had a little bit of activity 15 16 following the day 14 pulse and then nothing for 17 18 up to 21 and then no no census diet so no wheat was taken after so again so this we had um 17 days baited and it was four pulses but you can see this pattern of control um and we can see there, for example, on day nine, there was, there was kind of no, no bait was taken. 
but then when we pulsed up again i mean probably because there was no there wasn't that much available and then we pulse up again and we get more bait so pulse in baiting and pulse in control so having gone through that then the advantages of why why is it an advantage to pulse bait So do you remember I, I said there was less per bait point required? So these are just taking us through the, the Kuma tetrile, Bromodylon, Diphenicum. So I just looked at um, typical labels, not obviously not every label, but um, and then for pulse baiting, I looked at uh, Storm Secure and Storm Ultra. And we can see that for the surface baiting, it's typical 200 grams or up to 200 grams for rats and up to 40 up to 50 for mice for the pulse baiting um we've got for storm 40 to 60 and 20 to mice and for storm ultra 50 to 75 or 25 for mice so we can see straight away that there's per bait point there's actually less bait required and again this is related to the toxicity so less bait um, means less waste and when we come onto it, that that then has obviously other kind of advantages with, with visiting. So less bait placed, less waste, um, and then obviously less cost, less bait needs to be purchased. So the next one is fewer replenishments. And this is particularly important in a heavy infestation, but it's important to them all. And this is because it doesn't matter if there's not surplus bait available, so there is no worry that you have to keep visiting to, to make sure that there's bait available to the rodent, to the infestation. Because no bait being available, as I mentioned earlier, is part of, it's factored into the technique and it's factored into the toxicity of the, um, of the bait itself related to the toxicity of the active ingredient. Um, so fewer bait replenishments then, um, saving time and, and like I say saving worry that there's that you have to visit because what what if all the bait's been eaten and there's none available and that obviously then slows down control so and then the the third one is quicker control of the infestation so single feeds are obviously more toxic and that this is related so if if a so it takes um four to 10 days for a rodent to die from anticoagulant toxicity. So the quicker the quicker the we can start that timer, that four to 10 day timer, and the quicker the domination will be controlled. So for single feeds, as the for each individual, the, the kind of the clock of Lock of death, if we can say this, starts starts from the from the very first time that they come across the bait, very first time they eat it. So, but from that, then we would get quicker control with the single feeds. And this is um, kind of this is the last slide now, and I just want to go through um, baiting. So this is looking at surplus baiting trials that we did it's so, oh this is so this is for this is bsf so these were kind of diphenic and so using the data that we had we thought okay so what if we had a um a 50 point bait trial what would we need to be doing? So for the for the surplus bait, and it'd be 10 grams initial placement. For the storm storm ultra, it would have been 2.5 grams. So 75% less bait. Then I looked at how much bait we replenished. So for the surplus baiting, we replenished for these 50 bait points, we would have replenished 8.19 kilos of the of the diphenicum. And for the Storm Ultra, it was 3.01. So 63% less bait was replenished, needed to be replenished, again, relating to the technique. So in total, 
for the surplus baiting, it was 18, just over 18 kilos. And for the Storm Ultra, it was five and a half kilos. So 70% less. So then I looked at um, time to control. And for the, the Diphenicum, the surplus baiting trials, we had 98% control, percent control in an average of 25 days. For the Storm Ultra, we had 98% control in an average of 13 and a half days. So exactly that, and that wasn't, that was just coincidence that, but the same level of control at which we'd expect, I mean, we obviously would expect control no matter which product, um, but the same level of control, but obviously we have now quicker control. Um, so that's, this slide kind of sums up the, um, the advantages with regards to cost and time and kind of stress of, of worrying that there's sufficient bait there. And that is the end of the presentation. So questions. So um, do I go to Q&A? Yeah, if you go to Q&A, so I'm just down the bottom, I can see eight questions have, have popped up. So right then, do I get, um, right, oh, Q&A. Oh, eight, okay. No, it's, it's in, in and around buildings, indoors and around buildings. Um, so just just type... sorry, just go, if you could read out the question as well. Okay, sorry, yeah, oh, sorry, you no, can't no, see them. Fine. I'm taking this is for external baiting. So no, it's um, in and around buildings for it. Why is diaphylone classed as a multi-feed? Yes, it is classed as a multi-feed. Um, they don't claim, in fact, one of the labels I set saw might be um, said, not to pulse bait, so it is classed as a multi-feed. Um, uh, day one, first day take, is this taken into account neophobia? The answer is no. Um, obviously, um, neophobia is for any bait, whether it's uh, multi-feed or single feed, so no. Um, what, what I've said doesn't take into neophobia. So if that is it in the case, obviously everything is then delayed. LD50 figures for rats, are these correct as diphenicum? LD50 is nine. Um, so diphenicum LD50 is nine, that's correct. And the diphenicum 0.25 has an LD50 of 5.7. So no, um, no, the, t the table is correct. I had diphenicum and then lower down I add flacumafen. So I didn't have a 25 ppm um, or a 0025% um, diphenicum, but no, the LD50 figures are correct for diphenicum. And I know that because we reviewed the data for something else uh, this week. So that's, that it is correct. The next question is, well, pulse baiting, there is no guarantee the rats will feed on day one, correct? They could take several days until they feel comfortable to feed. Ha Correct. How will this affect the pulse pattern? Well, on the pulse pattern, so you, you're, vis you're pulsing on day one. When you visit on day four, if there is no, um, no need to replenish because there has been no bait take or minimal bait take, then, that, then that's it. You're into your seven day pattern. So you'll be visiting on day seven then and then every seven days. So irrespective of neophobia, um, you, you can still stick to this um, seven day bait pattern. We have tried flacumafen in different situations for both rats and mice and found it not to be very palatable. Um, okay, so I'm not sure if this is the Storm or the Storm Ultra. Um, I know Storm is a very... Um, Marmite, I mean, people can touch this, it's, it's fantastic, and others, uh, no, they, they just won't touch it. So I am uh, well aware of that. Um, but um, Storm Ultra is, is um, significantly improved on palatability. Um, with that in mind, take, knowing that we, there are cases for that. Uh, as the next one, as rats tend to feed, as, as rats tend to feed in a few favoured areas and taking into account rodent neophobia is pulse baiting. 
really any quicker well yes because you've seen the the data that we have and this is all um based on on data so it, it's all taken from trials that 13 and a half is taken from trials um there are two different difenicum figures so i'll have to go back to this if repeated so i'll go back to the table in a second if that's all right because this has been a couple of questions if repeated dose is not intercepted by the same rodent every time then single dose would not impart resistance against the molecule. So there is no resistance. It's, resistance is related to the molecule and there is no resistance to flucumafen or bromodialone relating to the toxicity of them. And that's how this is all based. Um, so if repeated dose is not, into, so yeah, even if they, they don't um, get a lethal dose, which I think is what the question is, then they still wouldn't become resistant to, um, to it. Okay. So if I could, and that's the last of the questions, no open questions. If I could just then go back up to the table of concern, if this is all right, I've just got a few minutes, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. You can just share your screen again as well. Um, oh yeah, sorry, right then how, sorry. Um, so share my screen. How am I doing that? Once, if I end show and then. Just down the bottom by the Q&A, there should be a button saying uh, share screen. Okay, let's take the answers. Yes, got it. Uh, Sorry about this, people. Okay. Um, Right, can, pe can everyone see my the, the table? Yes, we can. Slideshow from current slide. Okay, right then. So the 5.7 that everyone's looking at was diphenethylone. So diphenicum is nine. Underneath it is diphenethylone at 0025. And that's what's um, at 5.7, not diphenicum. Is that okay? Does that clear that up for the, um, the couple of questions that I had about that? And yes, diphenethylone is classed as um, a, a multi-feed, just to clear that up as well. Even though there is no resistance to it, so it's got some of the properties of the, the, the single feeds, but it, it's not pulse baited and they don't claim, it's not claimed on the labels or anything pulse baited. Fantastic. Thank you for that, um, Sharon. Sharon, just out of interest, it's quite a complex, um, it's, it's not, not in theory, but for some um, it can be um, quite, quite a subject. Is there any technical documents or any reading that can be done as extra for the delegates here? Yeah, yeah, there is um, on our website, um, we've loaded up uh, basically this PowerPoint, but as a, a Word document. Um, so that should be on it if somebody wants to go and, and read through it and, and, and come back to me with any any questions to the kind of the team but yeah it's on on our website there's a everything that i've said just in a in a kind of printable document fantastic, fantastic. okay perfect timing as well sharon thank you okay. very much oh yes yes thank you applause as well okay thank you. thank you fabulous okay so um as sharon mentioned there there's some some extra reading if you want to do and i'm sure get in contact with the uh, BASEF or any other um, any other support functions you have out there would be a great idea just to read up on that uh, a bit more. Fabulous. Okay, so that moves us nicely into our second speaker of the day. It's Peter Higgs from Beegon. Um, he's going to be talking about saving honeybees from structures, something um, a lot more people are looking into doing, whether they're subcontractors or workers themselves. So, Peter, I'd like to introduce you. I'm going to unmute myself and welcome. Hi, thank you. Yeah. Um, are we okay to sort of start? Absolutely. If you just share your screen and um, yeah. Cool, bear with me a sec. Okay. So what I'll do is start from... Cool, so uh, welcome guys. I've never done this before. Um, I've done a few presentations, or actually quite a, uh, quite a large number of presentations. I've probably done about 70 uh, to, 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 to 100 uh, presentations, but I've never done one via webinar. So 
Um, the only problem with doing that is you can't see what the next slide is uh, on PowerPoint uh, doing it here. Um, but uh, I'm really pleased to be here today and I'm really excited. Um, I've been uh, dealing with bees for quite a long time, um, keep bees as well. And um, if nothing else today you take away from this presentation, um, that the most important thing for me is that we can have a, have a plan B and hopefully sort of start saving bees together one way or another. So, um, with no ado, um, yeah, as I said, thank you to, to, to having me here today, uh, BPCA, and uh, to all of you in the audience. I'm sure some of you um, actually use us at the moment. Um, I know that uh, there are some of you that are registered on, so uh, hi and uh, welcome and thank you very much for attending today as well. Um, we've been moving bees for about, I've just over t uh, 12 years now. Um, so uh, you go back in the day, there wasn't actually anyone else advertising um, very well at all, a, a bit just solely bee removal, uh, just American firms and uh, so uh, we've been doing it for quite a long time now, um, all over the UK. Um, just a little disclaimer, we, uh, I'm not here today to, to, to recommend a way of doing it, um, you've probably got your own way of doing it, it might be completely new, you might not deal with bees, um, but I'm not here to, to recommend you do it in a certain way and I'm not here to give you advice either. Um, bee removal is typically quite a dangerous uh, area of work and we'll cover that today um, so please uh, listen up on that and, and uh, um, take notes. Um, so I'm just here to educate really um, and, and so that you can be the expert you know when your clients are phoning you you want to give them the right information. We go to a lot of jobs where customers are actually quite frustrated by uh, pest controllers that have recommended a certain solution or that they do this or do that or, or can't help in any way whatsoever. So hopefully this will give you an insight to that as well. Um, the talk will last about 20, 30 minutes, give or take. Um, and uh, say, if you've got any questions, uh, whack them in the Q&A box. So later, do. Um, uh, so, so we've been going a while, we started a business with the Prince's Trust and uh, as you can see here, I took some, uh, some, some bees up in, uh, it's called a nuke box that actually, and uh, with a viewing panel on top to uh, the 40th anniversary of the Prince's Trust and I took some bees up and uh, I was chatting to the Queen about the uh, bees. Uh, at that, that, that exact shot was when I said uh, we've actually got two queens in the room today and I pointed to one of the queens in the viewing panel. Um, I, was, I, I was debating whether to say it or not, and I'm pleased I did. Um, she did smile, actually, uh, <laughs> which was a relief. Um, so just, just, just to start, the most important thing for you to know, and, and probably one of the biggest problems in, in bees and wasps, and you'll all, you'll all be aware of this, is the misidentification, okay? There are over um, 250 species, around 250 species roughly in the UK. Um, that, that can, uh, that's included a 25 species of bumblebee, okay? Um, that's what a bumblebee looks like, I know we all know that. And then you get here, now that looks like a honeybee, that's not a honeybee. Um, and this is a big problem for bees. Um, that's one of the 224 species of solitary bee, okay? So they're bees like minor bees, um, masonry bees. You go to a job and loads of bees are going in and out of the grass and lots of, lots of different holes. Um, that's a type of uh, solitary bee. And uh, the masonry bees will dig out soft mortar in between joint work on walls, chimneys, um, and other places. So, uh, but they look very similar to, to uh, honeybees. And uh, that's one of the biggest problems these guys unfortunately face. Um, because, uh, and not only that, um, to, I mean, not to pest controllers, but to clients, wasps are the same shape. Uh, forget the color, um, they, that sort of same sort of abdomen and thorax. So, um, pollinators such as bees are estimated to be adding up to about 600 million per year to the UK um, uh, value. Um, and that's because they, they increase the quality of the crops and the amount of the, the crops as well. So in 2013, uh, this is now, we're in 2020 now, it'd be interesting to know what the figures are, but uh, they haven't updated any on there. So uh, uh, there are over 29,000 beekeepers managing around 126,000 bee colonies. Now, um, if you take an average size colony of bees um, and you said, okay, 50,000 in a hive um, times 126,000, that gives you a figure of 6 billion, 300 million insects. Um, so that will become relevant later on in the talk. Um, and that's a jump 
since 2008 to 2013, 50%. So probably jumped again. So that figure's probably well out now. The kinds in bee health in the UK, I mean, bees are there, that, you know, that there's obviously a lot of bees around. We know that you're getting calls probably every day, um, especially at the moment. Uh, it's been a great start to the year for them. Um, but they are wild bees and generally in the world are still suffering. That's due to disease. We'll cover a little bit of that today. Habitat loss, climate change, pesticides. Um, but it's not one single thing. It's a, a variety of problems that they are facing, which is having an impact. If you see lots of bees around, you've got to remember that a lot of bees in the UK are beekeepered. So when you think, oh no, bees are fine, actually, they're the, they're the beekeeper ones stuff and that are, are being watched and cared for. So bees are really important. We all know that. 90% of food worldwide is pollinated by bees. Um, but today we're here to talk about honeybees. So we're not going to talk about solitary bees and bumblebees. Um, and there's two types of um, the life stages of honeybees you will encounter. And basically, the, the first one of those is a bee swarm. Um, and this is where up to around 50% of a, of, of a colony in a in a hive or a, or, or, or a wall or a chimney will leave and will leave 50% uh, of the remaining bees in on the hive with a new queen ready to come out. So it doesn't completely leave, it's leaving 50% on average in the same place and this queen with all these bees are now moving on to a new location. So uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's, that's uh, interesting that picture. So this guy actually has, uh, they, they managed to get a pheromone and they put a pheromone all over him of a queen and the bees then uh, swarmed onto him and around him. So, uh, but we don't do that here at Be Gone. <laughs> Um, so swarms basically just to, just to cover off on that quickly um, you, it's best to remove them as soon as possible okay now you can charge that so it's quite a simple thing to do you know thing is with a beekeeper they'll go out free of charge and that might be the way you want to go but it really is just about getting a sheet and a box and you just bang the bees off and if you get the queen in there all the other bees will start surrounding the box and you can then move them even if you move them to a new location you might be helping your client out um, the difference with beekeepers there's a saying um, in uh, May a swarm of bees is worth a bale of hay in June they're worth a silver spoon and in July just let them fly so if it's in May or before um, or in July or after beekeepers aren't really that interested because the main honey flow is sort of finishing so they're not as interested a keen beekeeper might want to help out but you know uh, and also you know what else are they doing during the day um, you know do they want to go out especially with COVID-19 at the moment there's a lot of people you know beekeepers typically tend to be on the older generation and uh, a lot of those are actually staying in at the moment so it might be a good opportunity for you to, to get into swarm removal it's quite basic uh, beekeepers are not insured to go up um, there's a certain height on a ladder they can go up and then over that the uh, BBKA uh, British Beekeepers Association doesn't then insure them to do that so um, so moving on to bee colonies, um, so this is the other life stage, this is one where they've got comb, you see here, so this is uh, it's only one of my guys, um, this is a wall and this is where the beehive was inside, so if you imagine if uh, you know they're entering over here somewhere which is where they were entering and then on the other side of the wall and then coming through and then building the colony here, so that's a bee colony, okay, so they've got honeycombs and brood comb, honeycomb can extend off many metres in the wall space and the brood comb is, is, is in a different place normally and they keep that warm, so um, that's why we don't use heat sensing cameras and stuff because it won't pick up the majority of the honeycomb there. Um, this is in a roof space here. So again, the same thing. So you get them typically in uh, walls, uh, roof spaces. Um, that's about uh, three and a half, four meters up the uh, roof, that one. Um, and again, you get uh, chimneys as well. Um, the other place you can find bees uh, colonizing is trees. Now they go into these places because there's a void space. Honeybees need a void space to build honeycomb and uh, uh, the, the, the trees and caves are their natural habitat, which is why they love chimneys because again, fossil fuel burning and it smells like wood and all that sort of lovely stuff. So um, we recommend honeybee colonies deal with as soon as possible. Um, they can create up to 50 kilograms of honey in one year. So if you've had a colony that's been there 30 years, you can have a considerable amount of comb in there. And it's up to, I mean, average about 27 kilograms. But uh, live removal uh, is good for bee health. Uh, uh, feral colonies that are not being beekeeping and managed can carry diseases. So good reason to get them moved on. A typical honeybee colony, you know, 10,000 to 80,000 bees. 
Legislation, one of the biggest misconceptions, and probably all of you uh, have come across and questioned and, and been a little bit confused about because it is fairly confusing, especially for uh, beekeepers and uh, our clients, um, is legislation. Now, basically, it's quite simple. Um, the, 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 the main thing with bees is other bees will rob other colonies out. So they will, when they're healthy. So bees will be stealing honey from other bee colonies um, when the bees are healthy anyway. So when, it, when there's no one protecting the honey, it's even more likely that you're going to get bees stealing. Now, if you go back to that figure earlier, the 26 billion, 300 million uh, sort of figure, uh, approximately, <laughs> um, there's a lot of insects there and they will rob out that hive. So it takes 500 trips to flowers to create one teaspoon of honey. Um, so if they can steal it ready-made, they will. Um, so they will do everything they can to get back in that void space. And remember, it might not just be this entry here, it might be further around, around the corner. So the legislation there really um, uh, uh, is here and, uh, and I'm just going to skip through. I don't want to bore you with this and I'll show you where you can find more information about this. But um, if you want to screenshot or take pictures, uh, let me know. Um, so hi, there's a high profile case. So um, in 2008, where someone got prosecuted um, and they basically, um, um, uh, Natural England were involved with that. They have a special unit for it and it was for the contamination of, dis uh, of honey destined for food use because those bees were robbing the hive out. Um, and, uh, and they also, uh, because of the serious bee kills and destruction of managed and feral hives, um, so remember, if you do get involved with treatment, it's really important that you read the label and follow the code of practice um, because people are being prosecuted. I spoke to Natural England, actually, that show not that long ago, and HSE as well. Um, and due to the changes in labels and products, um, there's some, the, 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 there's, uh, some really uh, important things to follow. I think this case was around 20 odd grand. I think you got fined 25,000, something like that. Um, so remember the law of tort when you're dealing with clients. You know, you're the expert, you're the person they see to as knowing that they've got a pest. A pest is something that someone doesn't want. Um, you know, um, it could be a husband, it could be a wife. Um, you know, at the end of the day, if it's something in an area where someone doesn't want it, it's a, to them it's a pest. To us, bees are amazing, we love bees, um, but, and we deal, you know, you're dealing with insects every day, um, we're dealing with bees every day, so, um, we, you know, we love what we do. People, uh, you know, in a home don't love bees coming down a chimney. So. Um, the law of tort basically covers people for financial and physical harm. So if you recommend they go to a beekeeper and the beekeeper burns down their home, smoking the bees out, um, they might be claiming on your um, professional indemnity insurance. So just be really careful with that. Think, oh, there have been cases like that uh, uh, around in the UK. So options available um, obviously depends on legalities, um, what the client is after, how effective it needs to be and what you are competent with actually doing. Again, goes back to doing a swarm removal earlier. So this is the chimney. Um, so these are the, 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 the different types. So you've got the chimney removal here. You've got the trap out hive option. Um, that's again a trap out, that's a nuke box. So there's a, a different type of trap out, but the same sort of thing. And that doesn't remove the, uh, the, the bee comb, by the way. That's just removing a swarm or worker bees. The comb will still stay in the void space. So just be wary of that. The only way of getting honeycomb out of the void space is to cut the chimney or wall apart to actually get them out. You'll notice here we've got full restraint equipment as well, so we don't drop uh, bolsters and everything else. Um, moving on here, uh, again, uh, going back to the whole smoking the bees out situation, um, you're going to be really, really careful with that because uh, um, uh, it will push the bees deep inside the building and again, you've got a fire risk and using a naked flame on site is hard to get from an insurance perspective. We've got it, but it's very hard and you uh, need to be very careful. Risk assessments need to be done for every job um, and it's likely that embers will come out of that smoker, even if you've got fine mesh on the end. Um, another one is uh, BVAC, you've probably all heard of that. BVACs are good if, you, if you're doing, if you're doing an extraction in a shed or something like that. BVACs are okay um, and it just helps to get up those sort of bees that you haven't managed to, to, to clear up from an extraction job. We don't actually use them because we've got other methods that are very effective um, and that work very similar to a BVAC. Um, so pesticide treatment, and so, so one of the other options is pesticide treatment, obviously if you're following the code of practice um, uh, and sealing bees in alive, some of you have probably been involved with that. Um, and, uh, you know, um, so to, 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 to cover off some points on, on uh, that subject, just bear with me a second. Um, if you're spraying bees, 
and you're sealing them in alive, you need to be aware of where's that insecticide going and what's happening. Were the bees getting inside the house before? Because if the bees were getting in, it's likely the insecticide will follow. And if the insecticide follows into the voice space, it can be fairly dangerous, especially if people with asthma or, um, you know, who are vulnerable to that sort of thing. Um, but uh, again, it doesn't look good, does it? If a load of insecticides are coming inside the house. So just be aware, if bees are coming inside the house, I'd be very, very wary of using any, any chemical at all. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, it doesn't remove the honeycomb. So actually you've still got, remember, 50 kilograms maybe a year. You could have a lot of honey in there. And if you're sealing that all in, the bees aren't there to maintain it. It might start dripping through. Um, brood comb does smell. Um, so when you've got a load of larvae that's not being fed and dying, it can, it can start smelling pretty nasty. Um, and uh, sealing off, mm, fairly ineffective. We'll, we'll cover that in a second. Um, pesticide treatment and removing combs, if you follow the code of practice, this is something that they do say was and is something that can be done. Again, some of you may have been involved with this. My question to that is, if you're removing combs, why are you using insecticide anyway? You know, can you do it without actually the use of any chemical? Um, just really, you know, an important point, that one. Um, so this is where you want to go. So if you guys haven't got this, this is one uh, document that you really want to use to sort of in your inventory, really, to help you out. Some really good information in here. So um, the link is here. Screenshot the page if you need to. But again, the BPCA will be able to, to pass this uh, on to you. Um, now, um, uh, that's part of the legislation, following the code of practice and the label, if any chemicals being used. So um, we're not going to cover into that too much uh, more. But... Uh, um, Again, you know, if they're in a chimney and you're spraying a chimney, for an example, are you, um, you know, have you taken implications? Where is that dust going? Is it going down into a room where there's cats or, or other animals and, and, uh, and bits and pieces? Uh, we did one for a vet and uh, we, we, we did a removal job and it, literally the chimneys went straight down into the cattery in the basement. So um, sealing in, so if you're sealing bees in once you treat them, we come across this a hell of a lot and customers are not very happy when they say uh, the, the, the pest control man has been round and he's done his job and basically what's happening is all of the roof void is full of honey. They've been in there 30 years, 60 years, over 100 years, remember it's not the same bees, it's a honeycomb and you've got a substantial amount in there just sealing off the entry points that we're using here, can you see that? Um, there's a little bit of white staining around some of it, you can still see and some dust there, look. Um, so this was sealed and pretty ineffectively and, uh, you know, there's nothing to stop the bees going over here into these rafters and uh, the honey was all, all underneath here. So, um, you know, the, I think it actually expanded over to this, uh, per, uh, this, this rafter joist here. So it's all full all the way through into here. Um, Natalie, just keep an eye on my time for me if you can. If you can give me a heads up, um, I can move forward quicker. So, um, no problem. Ma ma massive area to cover. <laughs> um, so, um, and remember, it might not just be that area so that, that, that the bees are entering over here, okay? So what you might have, so for an example, on this type of uh, project where the bees are going in tile hanging, yeah? And you might think, okay, they're just in the tile hanging, fairly straightforward, let's just spray that and seal this off really well with some, with some, some sort of sealing. Um, the problem is, they might also be, in the uh, the floor the floor uh, joists, yeah, um, going under the floor um, and or a void space internally as well. So you look, so not just that there, there's a void space behind tile hanging uh, anyway, but there's also a void space here where you've got these joists, okay, and you've actually got these joists here as well. We've had it where they've gone through here and gone through um, uh, into this this location as well. So the longer it's in there, the more the bees will expand. Um, so uh, just a couple of points, a really boring slide, I hate writing, um, you know, you've got working at high, you've got building fabric, your waste disposal, you know, if you're actually doing a removal job with combs and, and they've been sprayed, you know, don't, you've got to be really, really careful, that goes to landfill, bees will forage on that if the bag's split, and again, then it's contaminated environment, whether or not they'll know you, you've done it is irrelevant, because uh, the thing is, bees will forage on that, and it's about our duty of care um, as experts to, to, to be aware of that, that, uh, you know, if you're taking honey out and it's being removed, what's happening to it at that point um you know and also you know how sticky a dry honey gets you know it gets everywhere so uh, again you know and, and, and uh, it's such a messy job 
Um, B liaison screen, uh, B spray liaison scheme notification. You know, have they been told that treatment's being done? Have you tried other methods first? It's all part of the code of practice. Um, should it should be done in the winter when the honey cells are capped? You know, not when it's all runny in there, regurgitating because that's what it is. It basically honey is bee spit. Um, so you know, you you don't want to be uh, treating that with all the cells open. Again, it comes back to the code of practice. You know, what have you done as a uh, to, to, to follow this and proofing with mesh uh, is not uh, even with uh, silicone as well it's not really very effective we go to so many jobs fire camera um D, interesting point was uh, bees were removed from the label in July. It still says about combs, and you're probably all aware of that. But uh, anyway, uh, that's going to be faded out soon. So we're going to move on from that one. Uh, Firecan uh, W, um, I think it's, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Nessie, but I think that must be used up by the 10th of December. Um, so that's, that's then that option now, which then leaves other chemicals, which HSC have told me I'm concerned about because there's some new active ingredient in some of the chemicals that's actually quite nasty. But um, it's a bit of a grey area, again, as to whether... You know, what classifies you know, as a flying insect, for an example? Can it be treated? Can't it? But just you've got to remember, it comes back to are other bees going to get contaminated and will that get into the human food chain? Um, so don't get too confused by labels uh, to a degree. You know, you just sort of use a bit of common sense, which we've all got, and just be really wary of, you know, what might happen if we spray this and I don't manage to seal that off because the client's not willing to pay for scaffold. You know, clients sometimes expect beekeepers to do this job free of charge, and it's, it's not a cheap thing to do. Um, this is uh, smoking bees out. So someone uh, recommended, I believe, that uh, beekeeper get involved, and the beekeeper went to smoke out some bees, and uh, and he set the uh, thatch building alight. And uh, I don't know how who paid for that, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so um, it does happen, um, and uh, so be really careful about recommending uh, uh, beekeepers swarms. Absolutely. Um, Bees in buildings, they're not insured, um, and the BPK, British Beekeeper Association, actually say that when you ring up if you've got a swarm. This is often what we find. Normally, when clients got a problem, they phone Pest Control or the BPK, British Beekeepers Association, and it goes to a beekeeper, and it goes back to the client, it goes back to Pest Control, and it just goes round and round and round. And then we're sort of in the middle, and eventually, even if a Pest Control goes there, we end up probably getting the work, and or beekeepers as well. Um, so um, uh, that, that's typically what we see happens. And people ring us up and say, we're, we're just the end of our tether. We've just tried so many other things, it hasn't worked. Again, remember, you're the expert to, to advise them on how things work. One of the biggest risks with moving bees we come across is asbestos. Um, working at height is also a big risk, but people don't realise that you can get asbestos board. There's a board called AIB asbestos. It's a very, very, very dangerous board. You can get it in soffits predominantly. You can get it uh, housing uh, metal, metal frames in buildings, uh, behind walls. You find it a lot hidden behind fireplaces in chimneys. So when you're taking all the comb out, get, chimneys are really dangerous to work the honey's going to drip you might think oh, okay let's clear the honey out from inside and actually um, fireplaces have been often been surrounded by AIB asbestos spores, especially in council properties and if you go cutting through that it's seriously dangerous stuff to be playing around with that's probably more what you're familiar with is the piping okay so um, uh, you know the, 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 the blue asbestos pipe it's really dangerous stuff to be working it's, asbestos is essentially found everywhere they're still finding it today in new products and things and materials so just again you know you get bees here you get bees here 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 you know we have to be really careful one of the biggest concerns with us in doing bee removal is asbestos so um also damaged chimneys really dangerous that chimney doesn't look too bad from the ground does it you know we looked at that chimney and thought okay we actually fly drones up when we do surveys we don't do jobs over the phone we actually do a survey first and that's side one that side two same chimney just a different side that you can't see okay so um, you know, if you're up there and you're digging the chimney, that's bowing out. That's that that chimney basically needs demolishing and then rebuilding. So it's very very dangerous, and you've got a very hard coping stone, flaunting stone. Yeah, it's probably been lifted up, um, already formulated, and just plopped on top. And now that's really heavy. You've got tons of brickwork up there, and that that comes down. It's not good news. So um, what you you know, that's what we do. So we we we, we actually put scaffold up all round round the uh, around the chimney and uh, do it safely. Um, that's that's sort of what it looks like okay um 
not this okay that 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 sort of thing is extremely dangerous um and we see photos and pictures and things like that a lot of the time and it is a risk so just be really aware of um you know again you know are we recommending i'll oh, just phone a beekeeper what's the beekeeper actually going to do because that's come from the experts or as what the client sees as an expert um so identification is a really good uh, reason to move bees. We know it was to like, that's a really small bee colony. That was me a long time ago, we'll move on. Um, so uh, clients have no idea. You know, let's face it, if they're up here, they're not really going to know anyway, um, even if they have a slight idea, because you can have what might seem like a wasp, ne uh, a wasp nest up here. Um, but what might be happening is you might have wasps flying in, stealing honey out of a honeybee colony. And if that's the case, and then you go and spray that, essentially what you're doing is spraying honeycomb and then, uh, you know, the, 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 the same problem with contamination and then getting into the human food chain. So um, just be really wary. When you've got bee, uh, wasp, wasps in buildings, just watch the wasps for a little bit and do your training with your technicians and just say, you know, watch them. Are they going in with, with um, food in their mandibites? Are they flying out with lots of material in their man bites what's going on what's the behavior are they dropping when they come out are they going straight up you know are they full of honey are they you know do they are they flying around for purpose you know we had one job we went to and uh, and essentially waited there for about 15 minutes and watched and there's wasps going in and out and then eventually we saw a couple of honeybees going in and out so um as i say wasps will take over a hive and destroy a hive by stealing all the honey so um especially if you get bad wasp season so be aware of that, um, but the customers don't have a, have a clue. So just be really careful. Don't take your customer's testimony for what they are and how long they've been there. Remember, that comb might have been in there for 100 years in the building. They found honeycomb in, uh, in pots in Pharaoh's tomb. So it lasts for a long, long time, especially in a dark void, um, especially if there's a lot of it. So they may have been in there a long time, okay? Um, so just be really wary. The customer said, oh, no, they've, they've just turned up, or you know, they might not have just turned up. Because again, there's an argument that, you know, if it's just a swarm of bees in a void space, there's no honeycomb, so I can't contaminate it with insecticide. But the problem there is, you don't know that there's no honeycomb in there. Just because they've turned up today, doesn't mean they've swarmed onto seven meters of honeycomb down a chimney. Um, so that's residue, um, you know, a, a really good reason to move is you're just gonna get ended up with more swarms, uh, breaking out of uh, chimneys and places. Um, uh, uh, as I said earlier, disease in feral colonies, a good reason to move bees is uh, a disease um, called foul brood, and that's seriously damaging to bee health. And basically, beekeep while bees are not being beekeeping and managed, there's a risk of this uh, disease getting into healthy bee colonies that are being beekeepered um, because these are not being managed. So if, if the National Bee Unit um, and uh, 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 certain people, I, I say it's not a National Bee Unit, beg your pardon, it's, a, it's another organisation that go around and they check your beehive for disease. If you have this disease, uh, I believe it's American fowl brood, then they will burn your beehives. Okay, it's that dangerous to other bees. Um, it doesn't matter how many you've got, they will burn a lot um, and, uh, and destroy them because it's really dangerous. Well, if you've got a feral bee colony in a chimney, no one knows if it's got that disease or not. So they can't say, shall I, shall I leave them, shouldn't I leave them? There's a good argument for actually getting them extracted from the building because then you're moving the risk of there being a, 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 you know, a disease source there. For other local uh, healthy bees um, you know another good reason fires we've been to and heard of a lot of people that say it's fine smoke the bees out from underneath the chimney uh, the problem with that is that if you've got a log burner and someone's cut the log burner pipe short and maybe hasn't even put a cowling on embers can sit on here and wax is very flammable which is why they use it in candles also this pipe heats up and this wax will start melting and dropping down and causing an issue underneath as well so this is actually a log burner pipe but if it's an open fireplace you it might be open enough for it to vent but there might be a bird's nest on a ledge and a bit of honey there as well and that's when it causes the problems it's extremely flammable again blocking um, pipes you know, you know they block boiler pipes some of them still go up chimneys um, so again working on chimneys very dangerous you know are you sealing up once you've sprayed the bees for an example are you sealing up a pipe that's used um, for, 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 for boiler gas and, and things like that so it's very very dangerous so these bees are actually going in Probably would kill the bees, right? But what happens if a bit of honeycomb slumps and then covers, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, part of the pipe? There might be a, a disconnection. They might have had a bit of a bodge job from someone putting in a boiler pipe. You never know. But then if you're getting involved with it, just be really careful. So, um, you know, moving bees from a situation like this is really important. 
Um, that's a bird's nest in a chimney, so that's how chock a block that can be. And often what we find is bees are on top of bird's nests or tangled in between it as well. Um, so then you have to extract it from inside and it's a blooming nightmare. It's really messy and not very nice at all. Um, I won't cover that because I don't think we're going to have enough time. But if honey sits in a, uh, a chimney, it can sit on ledges like this. And what happens is it drips down and you can actually have the honey drip through the ceiling of the uh, ground floor um, you know, rooms where it basically sits and pulls. It's absolutely nasty stuff, especially in this sunlight when the brickwork's all heating up. Basically, there's loads of risks. It, I, I'd be here all day if I spoke to you about them, but um, you know, just be very aware that dealing with bees is really not just bee removal; it's building work. You know, we're dealing with listed buildings. Is the building listed? How's it got to go back? You know, once it's been done, what happens if something falls off, chimney pot falls off, and lands on somebody or whatever else? You know, asbestos. What's the duty of care there? Um, you know, using power tools or beekeeping equipment on, you know, are the technicians and flat it? What's the purpose there? What do you do if something happens? It's a dangerous old job to get involved with. Um, so, as I said to you earlier, we do surveys, drone surveys of chimneys and walls to make sure um, we're all okay. This is, I see if it plays, this is uh, one of my guys. This is just to give you an idea of what can happen on a job. So, this is what you end up like when you do it properly. So, this is Will. You can see how covered in honey he is. That was from an internal ceiling. Um, all raft spaces were full. There's probably about 400 kilograms of honey that came out of that one. Just to give you an idea of what it can look like in a chimney, x-ray vision there. Um, that's not one of our pictures, by the way, just to let you know. But uh, that basically is what can happen, okay? So that will go all the way down. We've had it six, seven metres down a chimney before. So um, going down into the first floor, fire, um, ground floor fireplace. Been in there a long time. So it's very, very, very chock a block and full and it takes a lot of getting out um so if you're again for an example just because we're in the game of you know you're in the game sorry of using pesticides and chemicals then obviously if you're spraying up here you know really even if it kills all this top part of the hive off you know is there an entry point down here in the missing masonry where the bees can then sneak in and out again and then other bees might think there's no one protecting this bit let's rob this bit out so just be really wary of that Again, you can sometimes see how long bees have been in there by the staining around the entry point. So if you go to a job and they say it just turned up, looking at the staining there, that's propolis where the bees land on an entry point um, over a long period of time. Just gonna flick through some jobs now. So we cut the bees out and put them straight in a hive. That's how we do it. And that's got the queen in there that we've extracted. And then we do the rebuilds on the chimneys. Hello, Peter. We've got lots yeah. of questions coming through. Well, Just, uh, yeah. I'll give you a. I'm a pretty much up. that. That's pretty much yeah. I mean, chimneys need to breathe. We find that. Uh, um, you know, people. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to stop. Shall I just jump onto the questions then, Natalie? Yeah, great idea. Just so there's quite a few on there, and I mean, I love all the pictures as yeah. does everybody. Uh, but yeah, yeah jump good. onto the questions. That. Okay, great. lovely. I'll try and work out how to do that. Um, so let's have a look. I'm quite happy to read them out for you if that would be, be yeah easy. yeah let's let's shoot away yeah great stuff so um the first question was when you attend a bee removal job do you remove both the brood and the honeycomb yes we do yeah it's really important um otherwise you know uh, it, it, it also depends on what the client wants but if you leave residue in there whether it's brood or honey it's an issue we don't actually want the honeycomb because it can have diseases and stuff so that actually gets uh, destroyed we keep the brood comb and put that into the hive and actually extract them um, but we do take all of it out again if you if you leave the honey in there it's going to be really attractive for other bees to turn back up and it can start dripping through into other areas of the building Good stuff, good stuff. Um, another interesting question. So is bee removal something that is covered on normal house insurance? Because good question. Some, yeah, it can sometimes be a massive removal or yeah. reinstatement job, yeah. etc. Yeah. yeah, good question. A lot of the talks we do, that's one of the questions that come up. So that's really interesting. And the answer to that is some do, some don't. Um, it depends on the client and I think how, how persistent they are with their insurance companies to get in the, the problem resolved. What we do find is the reports we do when we do the surveys, which we do tar charge for, um, we find that actually they're able to use that report to actually send to their insurance company because um, it's very detailed, there's pictures on there and it helps them to get the work done. So it's a professional looking report. So that does help, but not all the time. I would say, well, I don't know, out of 10 jobs, maybe one. Yeah. Great. Um, we've got another question, actually. Um, so what areas of the country do you cover? 
So we cover um, all areas. Um, we are southern based. Everyone's employed uh, in and around sort of Surrey, um, but we do travel up. So the guys stay in a, uh, an Airbnb, um, and uh, we, we stop using uh, other big, large hotel chains <laughs> for various reasons. But um, yeah, so we, we travel around all over the place. I mean, they're not they're not sort of uh, cheap jobs. They're fairly sort of big jobs. I mean, scaffolding. You might be looking at sort of between five hundred pounds to fifteen hundred quid for a scaffold. So you know, it's not a few hundred quid here we're talking. So, um, but yeah, we cover the whole country basically. So it does, do, you know, we're going up to Scotland, it will be a bit more, um, you know, uh, if it's two or three hours drive, that's actually fine, four hours, fine. You know, the minute you start getting into a day's travel, we just say, we're just honest to the client. We say, we can, we can come and help you, but we just have to charge a little bit more for, for traveling. Absolutely, reasonable enough. Um, okay, another question. So do you think urban bee killing will create more conflicts between man and bees? And can you expect a more rapid spreading of bee diseases? Um, I, I'm not sure I understand that question. Uh, so do you think urban bee killing will create more conflicts between man and bees? Um, I suppose maybe it's I, that um, the, 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 the outside opinion of, you know, us, us treating bees and killing them. And okay. Um, I, I, I do think that, um, you know, the thing is, it's always, you know, it's, I think sometimes it's like, it's like having accidents on roads, you know, they don't put up signs on roads unless there's an accident. And it's always, you know, oh, it's all of a sudden there's no bees. We're going to have to change the legislation and move around. Um, you know, oh, someone's just died on that part of the road. We need to put a sign up there to say there's a junction. Um, so it's the same type of thing, really, I guess, is that probably it'll be a bit, you know, too late, maybe. I don't know. But uh, bees are so vital for the environment. Um, mm. And uh, hopefully one day there's a bit more protection put in for bees like there are for bats and for badgers as well because um, they are beneficial and if they do start getting a new disease or virus or whatever else there might be for them then like like the foul brood which i spoke about earlier you know that becomes a lot more prevalent um you know the mites they get varroa mites manageable but other diseases aren't so so if they've got that and then you've got urban bee killing and stuff like that then it's just not going to help great excellent um we do, we do one more question we are over a couple of minutes but i think there, there's 10 more or 12 more to go through which we're obviously not going to have time for so we'll hopefully be able to extract those questions and get you to possibly answer them and we can pop yep. them out to people on an email um yep. but just just one more question um will wasps kill honeybees when stealing their honey a good question um they will definitely fight if it's a strong colony the bees, and they haven't got varroa, they've not got ch like, uh, chalk brew, which is a minor disease they get, which is manageable, and they've got, uh, uh, you know, it, it all depends on the health of the colony. If it's a big, strong colony, they've got, you know, and they're doing very, very well, it may be one that's swarmed out from a beekeeper's hive, and they know what they're doing, they will fight wasps off, they will fight hornets off, uh, you know, there's a video uh, of the, you know, bees killing Asian hornets, they're clever things, they will swarm over the hornets or wasps, and they will heat them up, to a degree over what they can survive at, which will kill the insect. So they're clever, but if you've got a weaker colony that's not doing quite so well because it might have diseases or it may have been sprayed in the past, for an example, then those wasps that are coming in, um, you know, will take advantage of that. And again, if you've got a very, very large colony and you've got loads of honeycomb, they might not be able to protect all of it. So what you end up happening is big wasps absolutely foraging fine two metres or four metres away on the honey that's not being so protected. And then you've got the entrance, which is you know, quite clever. If you watch wasps, they normally go in the back entrance. <laughs> they are fascinating. Yeah, they? yeah. I mean, your passion, your passion comes through so much, Peter. Good. I really, really appreciate you yeah. going through that with us today. As I said, and there's 14 questions we haven't managed to get to, but I'd, I'd be, yeah. Those. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, and I'd be happy to answer them on an email or something like that. And um, just also to say to everybody that we, we work with, as I said earlier, you know, a lot of you are probably people we already work with. Um, we work with some of the national um, uh, pest control companies and we do bee removal for them so basically the way it works is you you would say is it okay for be gone to give you a call to your prospect or client and just have a conversation they might be able to help you out and we will go through and be open and honest with someone how much the survey is how we can help them out the benefits of using be gone you know we give them a fixed quote and a guarantee they won't come back and uh, and, and you can get 10 percent. so for an example if the job was four grand you would get 400 quid so it's it, it's our sort of thank you um to to, to, for the referral basically um, so just just to add that in you know if you'd like to work with us that's no thank you Peter great well um, really appreciate that we're going to have a, a quick comfort break now as well yeah, so great. Um, we will come back at 10.50 um, and we're, we're here from Barity and our sponsors
to go off and just have a bit of a comfort break, make a coffee, make a tea, get a snack. Um, and that's certainly something I always make sure I do. Um, fantastic. OK, so, yeah, some great presentations there to start off with. And as we said, any any Q&As that we have, any questions that we have that we don't manage to get to, really, really sorry about that. It's just obviously with the time we need to keep things flowing. But we will try and extract those at the end. I'm pretty confident we can do that. Um, send it to the present uh, presenters, get them to just answer them um, in, in word format, and then hopefully we can get it out to you on our email afterwards. So that's my promise. You can blame me, um, but certainly we will attempt to do that. Great. Good stuff. So um, up now, then we have uh, Baratine, and they'll be talking about Goliath Gel. It's the 20th anniversary. Can you believe it? Um, so I would like to invite, let me just move my screen out the way. Here we go. Scott Can. Are you there, Scott? <sighs> oh, there we go. Here we go. So Paul from Baratine will be doing the talk. Paul, if you could just unmute your unmute and show your camera. Oh, I think it's actually Helen from Vazza. Oh, that's sorry, Helen. Oh, sorry. I've got the wrong. Sorry there. We haven't got the details. Apologies, I can't see any of the videos or Hello, Helen, do you want to turn on your video? There we go. There we Thanks. go. Good stuff. Fabulous. Sorry. Right, so I will pass it over to you and uh, thank you. Okay. My, uh, hold on. Are you okay, Helen? Are you having trouble it's with like the screen? Or... Did, it, did it share then? Uh, just have a look. It hasn't quite yeah, shared yet. No, I'm keeping an eye on it for you. Okay, hold on. Down by the Q&A button, you've got the share screen button. Okay. If Scott has a more technical description for you, I'll invite him, but that's all I hear. Hi, Helen, if you just want to share your... Perfect, there we go. Is that it? Are we on? Is it working? Oh, we're in. Okay. Can we? There we go. So, um, yes, 20 years of um, Goliath. It, it doesn't seem possible, really. And I feel very old now. Uh, like some of you, you've probably been using Goliath since it was launched um, many years ago. I think I joined Pest Control, um, yeah, 99 or 2000. So I can remember. A, quite a few talks on this in the days gone by. So I just want to quickly go through um, Goliath for some of you that don't really know about it. Um, I'm probably a failing from BSF over the years, I don't know. But we've been asked by Barantine to talk about it as it's our 20 years. Okay. Are my slides rolling? Okay, good. So Glyph Gel, um, fast, reliable, um, it's highly palatable and stable. Uh, it's glucose free. And the thing most people know it for is the cascade effect and it's really low dose rate. So I wanted, people ask me about Fripronil quite a bit. So I just wanted to um, for you to see the LD50s on cockroaches of the different actives. Um, so these are from the trial results and some research that was done in 86 and 97. So that's how long this um, information has been around. And you can see there that Fripronil is the lowest with 2.6. And most of us will remember chlorpyrifos um, when that was about, and of course, bendiacarb, which has always been the go-to. So if we look at Fipronil and its palatability and how it works um, in comparison to other products. So because this is a global product, there's other actives on there that are no longer in the market in the UK, but I've left them in anyway. And you can see there that the uh, mortality rate of life within the first couple of days is impressive compared to others. And then when we were developing life to get the right formulation, knowing that cockroaches like all kinds of weird and wonderful things, we looked at the normal rodent diet that they have in labs. We looked at jam, we looked at water. Um, and you can see there again that the, the amount of time that was spent on the actual different feeding groups. And basically what we had was um, petri dishes with cockroaches in and blobs of each of the foods. So the cockroaches went to each of these and they were timed how long they would feed on each thing. 
So how does glyphosate get inside the cockroach? Well, it's mainly through ingestion and, um, and also through contact. So they pick it up on their, um, on their tarsus and also through their antennae and through their mouth. And what they do is they'll carry that back then to um, the harborage. And the thing that most people remember about glyph, as I said, is a cascade effect. It's this eating of the dead cockroach. So the first cockroach that eats it will die. And then the other cockroaches within the, um, within the harborage will start eating the feces and, the, and those dead cockroaches. And then um, because of the toxins in the body, the toxins actually pass through to each of the following cockroaches. So application rates, really low. So for German and brown banded, you're only looking at one or two spots. And I'll talk about the size of the spots in a bit. Um, Orientals, a little bit more, two to three. And American cockroaches, two to three. So size of spots. We developed these little key rings many years ago, and I had some made um, last year. And these are available from your distributors. If you want them or some of you might have picked them up off us at show stands. So each spot that you're applying is 0.03 grams. That's the equivalent of the size of a match head. So if you're a smoker or you've got a box of swan vestas or something, then that little dot on the end is the size that you should be applying, which means that each tube has got 1166 spots. And each spot is capable of killing up to a thousand cockroaches. When you put that in terms of cost, a spot is 0.04 pence. You know, um, so 4p a spot, it's not a lot. Um, in terms of a tube, it's 1,200 meters squares. That's nearly three times further than the nearest competitor. Um, and we always say, you know, you're using less bait, it's faster, and, you know, cost of treatment. But as I say, you do get a lot out of a tube. Because of our 20 years anniversary, we've decided to do a bit of a 20 years campaign and there's quite a bit on our YouTube channel um, about this. So if you go to BSF Agro, you can look at that um, and you'll see some things. But we just spoke to some different customers around Europe and you can see their comments here um, on, on the cost effective solution from some of the, some, some of the big uh, companies. And again, there's our own Brian Silcox. I don't think he's joined us today, but if anyone knows him, can tell him his pictures online. Um, and also Christian Roach. So that you know, for them, it's a it's it's a it's a fast product. It's a go-to product. And then we also spoke to people about the, the, the tested technology and the total control. And you know, um, Joe said there is his thing for him is is that cascade effect and and the reliability of it. So we well, just want to say thank you for two decades of trust and for buying Goliath. Um, it's been tried, people have tried to copy it quite a lot of times. Um, it's known for being a very um, low dose, a micro dose size of dots and being very cost effective. Um, I would say when you're applying the dots, so is to, to have a decent gun and to, and to keep um, your tips and things clean. So what um, we've we're doing with Barantine as part of this promotion and part of this event is that um, Barantine have put together an offer on Glyph. Um, so with every four tubes that you buy, you'll get a little goodie bag. And here you've got um, what is like a little insulated bag. You can use it for Glyph or Formador. Um, there's a small applicator gun, there's a, a pen that lights up and obviously the key ring. Also, if you want to follow us on Twitter, please do. Um, we're at BSF Pest UK. And if you want to give us some feedback on Glyph and some stories, we'll put you um, into the hat to win a £50 Amazon voucher, or you can email myself. And then if this video runs, this is just uh, a quick thank you. Uh, is it going to run? No, not going to run. Not going to run. Okay, it's not going to run, I don't think. No, technology has failed. So that's it from BSF, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Helen. Fantastic. So sometimes the technology doesn't uh, work as well, does it? But no, fantastic. Thank you. No. Um, no. no questions have popped up there, so I'd like to thank you. And if you just like to 
turn your video off, that would be great. And uh, we can mute and go on to the next speaker. Fantastic. Um, so, yes, just going on to uh, just a bit, a little bit of COVID-19 today, I think uh, we'd be lost without it. Um, again, Bar Bar Baratine um, talking about that. So if I could ask Oliver to unmute um, and show his video. There we go. Can you see the presentation? We can indeed. Thank you, Oliver. Great. No problems. Morning, all. Uh, and thank you for uh, Baratine uh, for the opportunity to talk about this. Uh, as we enter probably the period of, of lockdown release, um, this may be a little late, but the idea that we've been looking through from uh, talking about COVID and, and a, a bit of background, this is a new presentation. Obviously, everyone is is finding this whole process uh, very strange and, and difficult to uh, to work out how we work through it. It's not aimed at providing actual procedures. I think that's a, an area that needs to be covered separately. Uh, so the idea is that from a, a more a business strategy and certainly in the commercial world. Uh, it's probably more also a thought provoking uh, presentation than necessarily providing answers. Again, this is gonna be different to, to different people in different parts of the country possibly, uh, considering urban and rural uh, workspaces. Um, more discussion is definitely going to be required, I suspect. Uh, Baratine um, are looking at uh, possibly more dates on that side, as I'm sure BPCA will as well. Uh, and obviously, if you have any questions, uh, as with everyone else, we'll do our best to get through them. Now, I think when we talk about expectations, this is the experience that we've been having, uh, both as trainers and also as, as consultants back into to pest companies, uh, is that most customers, because they're not seeing anyone, they're not believing that a service is being provided. I think this is a, a difficult area because then all of a sudden you present your invoice uh, and of course their perception is they haven't seen anyone, so therefore, uh, what are they paying for? More and more companies are, are doing something, so that shows that there is an element, element of, of due diligence. How that works with external bait boxes, is it providing a service? Will the customer then pay? At least it's a demonstration that you turned up, that's something. Uh, as I say, will they pay the full price? Probably communication, I think, is, is the best one out of this. And also as well, of course, if the site's fully closed, how do we demonstrate and verify that a service actually was provided? And again, this is where maybe technology comes in. So a, a camera pictures to say that you were there, um, as well as obviously electronic reports. But of course, if there's no customer signature, uh, is there any due diligence? So turning up and servicing external boxes, as I say, does confirm uh, attendance. But what about internal dates? How do we monitor that? How do we carry on providing the service uh, when we can't necessarily gain access inside the building? What if the baits have run out? Technically, are we then providing a service at all? And particularly when we then start to consider, oops, sorry, particularly when we then start to consider that the whole role that we're, we play within the pest management sector is about reducing risk. If we don't have any baits on site, what are we actually providing? If we're using traps, and, and increasingly more and more people are using traps, uh, obviously with, with crew elements coming into play from a rodenticide use. But what if they've gone off? You know, for the last six, seven, eight weeks or so, uh, you know, what activity has actually been occurring? And increasingly, we're seeing more and more service. Sorry, we're seeing more and more activity uh, occurring on sites. So how do we gain entry to continually provide a service, particularly, as I say, when the, the sites are closed. And I think that's the element that we've really got to, to start communicating back into play, particularly if you have been affected by the building is shut, therefore no service can be provided. But of course, we also then have a, a, a legislative requirement on ourselves as well because of product label. You know, we can't ignore the fact that rodenticides have been applied. If the product label says they have to be frequently inspecting, well, we've got to frequently inspect. Now, just a, a, a almost a, a conflicting or an opposing point of view that we have here, having spoken with other pest control companies, some have actually taken the point of view that they're not going to service. Kind of an interesting approach on that side of things, because what they're then doing is they're saying, well, actually, we are all in this together. If we're not going to provide a service, can we affect the invoices? Now, that's a very generous uh, approach that you come into play on that side of things. Or is it just a really good positive marketing opportunity? Because if we're gonna go down that we know it's tough, actually as a pest control company, we then here to help and save where we can. And more and more people moving to a pay as you need service. Again, interesting uh, discussions on that side of things. But I think that the key as we're coming out of this lockdown period must be about communication. And again, I'm sure all of you experienced different levels of, of, uh, of communication and, and 
replies from your customers in terms of how they perceive the service uh, should start and resume. There is a side that says, should we have ever been suspended? Should we have ever stopped attending site? Again, particularly when we take the fact that pest infestations and, and rodents, particularly in the urban areas, are now significantly increasing. Will the customers want an additional person back on site? You know, as more and more buildings open up and we have this whole social distancing and the cleanliness element coming into play, do they want another person? Again, these are conversations to probably have with your customers as soon as possible uh, in terms of starting the, the process. Are our staff suitably aware and trained on how to provide a service? So going into properties, yes, we wear PPE, but are we wearing them for PP, sorry, are we wearing them for COVID points of view or are we wearing them just because rodenticide uh, and insecticide product labels say so? Again, more and more customers may well want a due diligence element that confirms that service staff are aware of the, uh, the procedures they need to follow. Is there a, a, gonna be an increase in activity for sites that were closed? Who pays for that? Because if, if service hasn't been occurring for the last six to eight weeks, and we do have an increase in rodent activity, more and more visits will now need to be made in the next couple of weeks. So how does that affect the income element? Let's say, ultimately, who pays for it? What if pubs and social environments are a primary customer type? You know, they're not going to be open for another month or two. So is there something, again, we could start this whole communication in terms of the, we need to get back in, we need to start making sure that, that what we're doing uh, is, is working and key. And I think probably a much bigger piece is, what if we have a second peak? More and more, we're talking about the need to get out and, and, and start being active again. But what if we do go back into lockdown? Can we take this as an opportunity? So we've then got our service agreements. And again, just on the legal elements that we've got, do we all operate with service agreements? Are they all up to date? As I say, more and more consumers are now looking for a pay per visit, which is less paperwork, but equally it's less due diligence on that side. If a customer's not willing to pay for the last couple of months, and you know most of us will invoice quarterly in advance, do we remind them that a service agreement has been signed? And do you get legal? Because all of a sudden, will that annoy your customer? Will they then not like the fact that you are trying to enforce it? Again, particularly if they have had harder financial times. If customers believe that no service has been provided, do we need to go back and revalue the service agreement? Do we need to resell? Actually, what we provide is 52 weeks of a year cover. It's not six treatments a year or eight treatments a year or 12. And that's very much the perception that customers have. You turn up eight times a year, I pay you for eight visits. It shouldn't be. They pay us for 52 weeks of a year because our service equipment is always on site. Other industries uh, and organizations are obviously still receiving an income. So do we now start to think about standing orders rather than an invoice that we wait 30 days, actually set up the standing order or direct debits uh, on that side of things? Uh, and that's where, again, your whole cash flow, your account management is also key during this time, because what we need to do is make sure that any invoices that have been generated are paid. And if they're not paid, you don't wait another 30 days once that business has reopened again. Your cash flow will be king. I think that the safest thing to say is the future is not going to be the same. No one really knows what it's going to be. And say, what if we have a second peak? What if lockdown's implemented again? Uh, what if more customers do move to this pay as you need agreement? And if this is a warning shot, actually, do we need to start to prepare for a different way of thinking? Now, arguably, we should be thinking about a different way of providing a service. If you consider crew and the uh, tighter control on the on use of rodenticides, actually, is it something that we need to start doing? But I think what is key out of this is that we start communicating the value of pest services, because if we have been closed and no access to site and the risks have increased, then people maybe don't understand the value of what it is that we actually do. Could technology come into play? Now, more and more people are, uh, are bringing technology to the marketplace where we have this 24-7 uh, monitoring equipment. Changes the rules in terms of how we engage with customers. If a second peak comes down, how do we prepare ourselves? Well, again, maybe technology does come into play. This is a, an image taken from a, an office block in London about three weeks ago where the pest controllers were then able to communicate with a customer, uh, actually from a remote monitoring, and I'm not pushing any of the systems particularly, but it's, it's the only 24 7 52 service provision. This is true proactive. It minimizes the need to enter properties because, again, we can rely on the technology to allow us when and where we need to go and what we need to do. 
Uh, in terms of barrier to exit, it's also a great uh, contributing factor from a customer's point of view, because that's replacing the need for a bait box to monitor. We then come in with traps, obviously, uh, after that side of things. And I think that's very much where these overview points of view in terms of working with, with coronavirus, uh, as we come through lockdown, as we ease where we're starting to, to come from, these are questions I think that we're going to have to start discussing. Is there any questions? I appreciate that these are short and sharp uh, presentations. Fabulous. Thank you, Oliver. Yeah, there's one question popped up. I'll read it out for you if that's uh, then you can concentrate on the more important answer. Um, so it says here, with lack of food due to kitchens and takeaways and pubs, etc., being closed for such a long period, meaning that there's no food on site, are rodents maybe moving on and foraging further afield? And will this impress upon customers the importance of cleaning up spillages as this is in the likely all likelihood the main source of food for rodents as opposed to properly stored foodstuffs? <laughs> will question will customers learn that no food equals no pests? Yeah. Um, I, I think the first part of that question, actually, that, that they're changing their feed at, feeding habits is definitely something that's going to start to come through. You know, for the last six or eight weeks, rodents have had to work a different way of finding food. Uh, how much food was left on site when these offices closed down in the first place? Um, will customers learn from it? There's almost one side you hope not, um, because that will distribute and disrupt the way that rodents work. I think that customers will still rely on pest controllers to solve pest issues. They'll go back to their, their cleaning habits from previously. Uh, there is one side of, of actually maybe cleaning habits will reduce, you know, staff, labor, uh, how people feed, where they feed. Um, are there, is there money going to be around for as frequent waste collection? And, and I think that's where the, you know, the future will change as to, to what and how we provide a service. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, it seems like you covered that subject amazingly because we haven't got, oh, we just have one more pop in. Do you know what? Oh. We're two minutes over, but let's just quickly cover this. So many thanks. Just, oh no. Okay. It's like someone asking for a link. Oh, right. I'll provide <laughs> that to them. Uh, great. Oliver, thank you so much. Really appreciate no worries. that. Uh, Cheers, guys. Turn your video off and mute. Thank you. Great. Good stuff. So yeah, always important just to, to cover ourselves on, on COVID and what we're doing and how we're doing it. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, great. So we move on to uh, Chris from uh, Stella Kane. Chris Bartley will be talking about PPE and me, a quick refresher on it, which uh, certainly is a very popular subject and question that we, we get at the moment. So Chris, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll just share my screen. Put that on. From the beginning. Okay, hello, and um, hope everybody's uh, safe and well. Um, my name is Chris Bartley. I'm a senior health and safety advisor for Stallard Kane. We work very closely with the BPCA. Uh, we're a health and safety consultancy that operate UK wide. Uh, we've been quite busy actually recently with. Uh, everything that's going on with COVID-19, people going back to work and wanting advice on the measures that they need to put in place. And we're getting a lot of questions regarding PPE as well. What I wanted to talk to you about today is a brief guide on personal protective equipment. It's not solely based on COVID-19. It's more uh, an overview and a refresher for you people who, who use people uh, PPE on a regular basis. So you know exactly what to do, when to wear it, the training and the information that you need to provide. Okay, so it's an overview of, of personal protective equipment. Um, you know, there's only so much that we can cover in, in 25, 30 minutes. But throughout this section of the webinar, what we will be doing is looking at the following. So we want to look at what is PPE? So the different types of PPE that are available to us, you know, why we should use it, why is it important for companies to use personal protective equipment. Uh, we're going to have a look at some health and safety legislation. Uh, we'll certainly be looking at the Health and Safety at Work Act and what your duties are as employers and employees. But also, I want to look at specific regulations, and in, and in this instance, the personal protective equipment at work regulations, where that places specific duties on employers and employees in regards to what we need to do regarding providing PPE, wearing PPE, and again, the training and the information. And then 
what we'll do is look at the different types of PPE in a little bit more detail, the hazards that are associated with the different areas of the body and, and what, what our options are in regards to PPE um, and some other sort of tips to, to take on to make sure that when providing PPE, it's used correctly and at the right times. Uh, and obviously because of the current climate and the pandemic that we're going through at the moment, I did want to cover slightly a couple of slides on personal protective equipment and COVID-19. Uh, and also, I, I know a lot of uh, the BPCA members and clients of mine um, that are in the pest control industry uh, will be required to wear tight-fitting face masks, uh, respirators, and there's a need by law to, to carry out face fit testing. And, you know, I've questioned really, you know, how, how safe is it to carry out a face fit test in the current climate, you know, with without transmitting uh, the virus. So I'm going to be covering that because the HC provided some good guidance on how you could ensure that your operatives or yourselves are being face fit tested to reduce the transmission of COVID-19. So we'll we'll cover that as well uh, at the end. And then I'll, I'll take any questions uh, that come in and, and, and answer them as, as best I can. So what is PPE? Well, personal protective equipment is, is equipment that will protect the user against health and safety risks. And that can, can include uh, safety helmets to protect the head from falling objects or in, in probably common circumstances within your industry is, is working in confined spaces potentially where you can, you can bang your head uh, on pipe work or steel work. I, I presume many of you have found yourselves in situations like that. Also suits, hazmat suits or disposable overalls that will protect your body against uh, any sort of chemicals or corrosive materials or in any heat or extreme heat or, or cold temperatures. You may work on uh, some commercial clients' properties where there's vehicle pedestrian movement. So high visibility clothing is, is needed and that's a form of PPE to reduce the risk of vehicle pedestrian collision. Safety footwear is uh, also personal protective equipment and the safety footwear is, uh, that protects the ankles, but also the feet. Um, if you're working at height, a lot of you may be wearing safety harnesses where there's two different types of lanyards. There's fall restraint and, and, and fall arrest lanyards, earplugs or ear defenders to help protect against noise exposure. And of course, the big uh, question, uh, sorry, the big debate at the moment is, is, is respiratory protection equipment really is uh, one of the HSE's hot topics at the moment is, is wearing respiratory protection equipment for the activities that you carry out that, that sort of create uh, contaminated air from dust or fumes. Uh, and the HSE are, are obviously doing a lot of spot checks and checking that People are wearing the respiratory protection equipment for the normal activities that create these hazards, but also the employers are, are ensuring that their employees are face fit tested when they need to be on, on the certain types of RPE. PPE does not include ordinary working clothes or uniforms that aren't designed to protect the user from health and safety risks. Doesn't include clothing to provide for food hygiene purposes, and it doesn't include, it, personal protection equipment in, in the workplace doesn't include things like motorcycle or bike helmets that are, are designed to protect the user when they're on the roads. Why is PPE important then, you might ask? Well, PPE, if we talk about the hierarchy of controls when controlling the risk of certain hazards, PPE is always considered the last resort and it's always better to be a substitute for more robust control measures. The reason it's, a, uh, it's classed as a last resort is because PPE protects only the person using it, whereas measures controlling the risk at source can protect everyone at the workplace. So if I use an example, if there was five of us having to go and work on a roof and there was full edge protection all around that roof, that roof is going to collectively protect all of us from falling which is a more robust control measure than me being the sole wearer of a harness, which is only going to protect me. It's not going to protect the other four workers. So what the HC wants to do when we follow the hierarchy, want us to do when we follow the hierarchy of controls is, is look at engineering controls first. And then only when we have a, a residual risk still outstanding that we need to 
reduce that risk even more would we wear PPE. Theoretically, uh, maximum levels of protection uh, by just wearing PPE without engineering controls are seldom achieved. And the real level of protection is difficult to assess. And that's because sometimes wearers of PPE may not have fitted that personal protective equipment properly, or they fail to wear it when it's required. And a common um, circumstance when this might happen is people perception of the risk or the fact that the job's only a short job and they can get it done quickly so they don't need to wear the PPE because they feel that they, that they might be safe and then they're not actually wearing the PPE when it's actually required. Effective protection can only be achieved by equipment which is correctly fitted, maintained and properly used at all times which I will be talking about further on in this presentation. PPE may also restrict the wearer by limiting mobility, visibility, or being able to hear instructions uh, or site traffic if you're working on a commercial property. And the use of PPE may alter employees' perception of the hazards that they are dealing with. So if I'm saying all this, why is it important then? Why is it still important? Well, because it is a last resort control measure and, and is used to supplement more robust control measures, it's critically important as it's generally only used where other measures haven't reduced the level of risk to an acceptable level. So even where engineering controls and safe systems of work have been put in place and been implemented, some hazards still may remain. And these hazards may include uh, breathing in contaminated air, which is a, a risk to the lungs. Okay, you may have certain extra extraction systems or dust suppression systems, but there may still be residual dust or contaminated air that means that you actually have to wear PPE to reduce that level of risk even further. Some of the tasks that you actually carry out that produces, I don't know, chemicals, pesticides, you can't extract uh, that um, substance because you need that substance to be within that area that you're actually extracting. There may be other uh, engineering controls that you use, but the PPE would supplement that. Uh, there are uh, hazards associated with the head and the feet from falling materials, hazards associated with flying particles or splashes of chemicals or corrosive liquids that could affect the eyes. There's hazards that can be associated with affecting the skin, so contact with chemicals and corrosive materials. And also, again, hazards associated with the rest of the body, such as contact with chemicals, again, or being working in extreme heat or, or cold temperatures. PPE in these cases is, new, is needed to reduce the risk to an acceptable level, being even further. So we've all, I want to briefly talk to you about health and safety legislation then in the UK and how that fits in with wearing personal protective equipment and the duties that you have as employers and employees. Now, if we just look at the primary piece of legislation in the UK, we have the Health and Safety at Work Act. Now, the Health and Safety at Work Act came out in 1974, and it places primary duties on employers and employees. Under Section 2 of the Health and Safety at Work Act, employers have a, a duty to ensure the health, safety and welfare of their employees as far as reasonably practicable. Employees also have a duty to cooperate with their employee, uh, employers in the interests of health and safety. We then are under, under the Umbrella Act to have specific regulations, again, placing duties on employers and employees in relation to specific areas of health and safety. We have the Management of Health and Safety at Work regulations. And now you've all had to carry out risk assessments during your working life and had to follow risk assessments. And this is where the absolute duty comes to carry out suitable and sufficient risk assessments on your activities. This is where you would consider the hazards and the control measures that are required to reduce that level of risk to an acceptable level. And this is where you would also consider your personal protective equipment that you'd need to provide to control those risks. Now, if you look at the Personal Protective Equipment at Work Regulations 1992, that places specific duties on employees, and, sorry, employers and employees. And one of the main duties is that PPE must be properly assessed and used, uh, 
used in the right times and made fit for purpose. OK, now, if you're assessing PPE, you've got to make sure that the right PPE is chosen. Consider the different hazards in your workplace and identify the PPE that you'll provide that will, will, will provide adequate measures against the different hazards and the risks. You might need to contact suppliers of personal protective equipment to get further advice on the equipment that, they're, that you're going to be purchasing from them and that they're going to be supplying yourselves. Consider that whether the PPE protects the wearer from the risks and takes account of environmental conditions where tasks are taking place. So, for example, you might provide eye protection, but is it the right type of eye protection? Is it if you're carrying out a task where um, it may produce projectiles that need impact resistant goggles instead of general safety spectacles that protect against dust, you need to assess whether you're providing the right type of PPE. Consider whether PPE um, that you're providing uh, increases the risk. I mean, certain levels of hearing protection may be too strong for the noise that you're being exposed to, and that may make it difficult for communication or being able to hear safety communication or um, site traffic if you're on a, a busy commercial site where you're providing pest control facilities and services. PPE must be maintained and stored properly, so you need to look at having a, a number of replacement personal protective equipment if you're providing disposable PPE for the activities that you're undertaking. If you're providing semi-disposable uh, personal protective equipment, make sure you have the right filters for the masks that, and replacements for the masks as well. Make sure there's a regime in place where employees would check the personal protective equipment before they use it and that they know where to report back to if that personal protective equipment is broke, damaged or needs replacing. And in relation to storing personal protective equipment, it needs to be stored in a cool, dark, dry place where it's not going to be exposed to all the chemicals or contaminants. You may have a, an area in the back of your vehicles or in your storerooms, a box where, or a bag that allows you to store your PPE properly. You also need to make sure that you're providing your employees with the right training and information on how to use personal protective equipment, okay? Um, so you need to let them know as when they're supposed to use it, how they're supposed to check it, how they're supposed to change the filters and fit the masks or fit the glasses or, or, or the head protection properly. Even the harnesses, you probably need, if you're wearing harnesses, more formal training on, on how to fit that harness, how to use the lanyard and how to inspect the harness as well. And for employees under the personal protective equipment at work regulations, you have a duty to use that PPE correctly. Um, and one final note on that is that when employers are providing personal protective equipment for the work activities, you're not allowed to charge for it. It, 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 it does have to be provided free because it's in the interests of health and safety. OK, so if we have a look at the different types of personal protective equipment in more detail and have a look at some of the hazards that are associated with why we wear that PPE. If we look at the eyes. Well, the hazards associated with damaging the eyes are chemicals or, or metal splashes, dust, projectiles, gas or vapours that can get into the eyes and really damage the eyes. Uh, using an example of somebody I know, they were actually um, using personal, uh, sorry, they were, they were working in a confined space and there was uh, dust and, and quite a lot of contaminants and he got something in his eye and just went straight home, uh, didn't go to the hospital, didn't go to the first aider and when he woke up the next morning, he couldn't see out of one eye and he wasn't wearing glasses so that's why he got something in his eye and um, he went to A&E because he couldn't see and that basically, they, they had a look at that and he, it was a piece of metal that got in his eye and it created a rust ring around his eye. So if he'd have been wearing glasses, then um, it would have probably protected him from getting PPE into his eye, getting um, contaminants into his eye. Now, hazards associated with the, the head are from impact, uh, from falling objects or risk of bumping the head uh, in confined spaces. Well, options such as industrial hard hats or bunt caps uh, would protect against things like that. 
Um, you can get a bump cap, which is sort of um, a reinforced cap, which is good in, in situations where you're working in confined spaces. Hazards associated with, with, with the ears are uh, being exposed to noise or a combination of sound levels and duration of exposure, or even in certain circumstances, high levels of uh, sound in even short duration circumstances. So you could wear earplugs, earmuffs, semi-disposable or insert caps. And um, what these do is they provide a level of protection that should be proportionate to the level of noise that you're uh, being exposed to. Like I mentioned earlier, choose the right protectors that reduce the noise to an acceptable level so you can still allow for safety communication or hearing things like um, uh, site traffic or anything like that that you need to be aware of. Uh, if we look at the hands and the, and, and, and the arms, you, the hazards associated with the hands and arms are abrasion, temperatures, cuts and punctures, and, and being uh, in contact with chemicals, uh, biological agents. Uh, you can wear gloves. There are different types of gloves that you can wear. So be careful and, and make sure that you, you provide gloves of the right rating. If you go on the HSE's website, the HSE, I've got a, a, a website within that called the Skin at Work website. It'll show you the different types of gloves that you can, that you can provide for the different hazards. Uh, so just make sure when you're doing your risk assessment and, you, and you're writing your risk assessments, you include in any safe system of work, the type of gloves or the type of eye protection that you're going to be providing. If you just put provide safety gloves or provide safety glasses, it's open to interpretation and it's ambiguous. You need to be specific. Uh, again, looking at hazards associated with the lungs due to contaminated air from dust, gases or vapours. Respiratory protection equipment is the form of PPE that will protect against this. Again, you need to make sure that anybody using tight fitting RPE is face fit tested. And anybody who wears tight fitting RPE would need uh, to be clean shaven. So you couldn't be like me looking like uh, Tom Hanks out of Castaway at the moment and wear tight fitting respiratory protection equipment and have it work effectively. And finally, if we look at the whole body, uh, the hazards associated with the whole body are um, heat, chemicals or spray from uh, from pesticides or other chemicals. You can use uh, conventional or disposable overall, overalls, boiler suits, aprons and, uh, and chemical suits as well. And what I wanted to do, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, is, is just cover a little bit about COVID-19. We're getting a lot of questions in as a consultancy at the moment where people are asking us um, what measures they need to have in place to reduce the risk of transmission so they can sort of start going back to work and, and, and working as normal as possible in, in these you know, uncertain times. Again, a lot of questions about personal protective equipment. And the government's stance on it really is the best uh, defence against the spread of COVID-19 is the regular um, cleaning of, of, of surfaces and enhanced cleaning measures, for a washing and sanitising of hands and um, social distancing, obviously we've heard that a lot, and maintaining social distancing where we can. This is proven to break the cycle of contamination. You might carry out a risk assessment uh, and it might identify some of the clients that you're working at, uh, there's a higher risk of, um, of transmission of, of COVID-19. Now you follow a hierarchy of controls first and look at whether you need to do that job. But if it's essential, you might want to provide some extra forms of, of personal protective equipment. This could be nitrile gloves for touching surfaces, uh, face masks. Well, face masks to protect against COVID-19. Um, there's very little evidence that it protects against transmission. It can it, there's little evidence to say that it can protect anybody else when you're wearing that face mask, but all you need to do is wear um, a covering like, like this one that you can get from the supermarket. So actual face masks, respiratory protection equipment, they're, they're actually advising that you save that for, you know, the activities that you're carrying out that you have been for years to create those extra hazards that require to use RPE, or potentially it needs to be saved for NHS staff and, and people working in clinical settings. You may, you may provide reusable personal protective equipment that would need to be thoroughly washed and cleaned after every use. 
you need to wash your hands before using the PPE and after using the PPE. And if you're using single-use PPE, it needs to be disposed of after you've used it. Okay, so finally, those of you, and there'll be a lot of you out there, that have to wear respiratory protection equipment, tight-fitting face masks, for your everyday activities where hazards such as fumes, dust, and chemicals are present, so non-COVID uh, risks will need to be face fit tested. The HSE still want face fit testing to, to go ahead. But there are certain measures that need to be put in place so we can follow social distancing measures and ensure that those face fit tests are carried out in a safe manner to minimize the risk of transmission of COVID-19 during face fit testing. So you need to follow some additional measures. Now, those of you who carry out face fit testing internally, who've had the right training, can go on the HSE's website. If you type in COVID-19 face fit testing, there's a lot of guidance on how to carry out the face fit test by maintaining social distancing measures when you can uh, and making sure that the fit fitters and the face fit testers are, are not at risk of, of transmission. So you want to consider a couple of points which uh, fit testers should allow for social distancing measures and those um, being fit tested should keep the respirators on if, if close observation is required to minimise the risk to testers. Both the fit tester and those being fit tested should wash their hands before and after the face fit test. Those being fit tested with non-disposable masks should clean the mask themselves before and immediately after the test. Test face pieces should not be used by more than one individual. And fit testers should wear disposable gloves when undertaking the cleaning of the tubes, the hoods, and uh, any other equipment that you're using to carry out that face fit test. Any of you who've ever attended a face fit test section it, at uh, uh, session, if it's a, a quality face fit, a quantity, sorry, quality face fit test, it's where they put a hood over you, you put the mask on, and a solution is sprayed into that hood to see whether the seal fits uh, and isn't uh, breached and you can't taste the solution that's coming through. Uh, immediately dispose of any used gloves, disposable masks, cleaning wipes in the bin after the face fit test. Anybody who's showing symptoms of COVID-19 should not attend a face fit test session. And um, yeah, just, just go on to the government guidance, uh, uh, sorry, the HSE's guidance on face fit testing. There's actually got, uh, a video on there on how to carry out the face fit test, how you can observe and, and tell the face fit testers to put them, the, the, fate, the fitters to put the mask on from a distance. Uh, there's actually a video as well that shows you how to do that. So that's it really for uh, my section of the webinar. I, I hope it's given you a good oversight of PPE. Anything that really covers COVID-19, I hope I've covered that. And if you've got any questions, I'm open to, to questions now. Uh, That's that great. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. Really, really appreciate Sorry. that. Actually, there, there's, there's two questions on there, and um, I'll read out uh, one of the first ones that is, is a really popular one, and you kind of covered it a little bit, so maybe we can elaborate on it, but it's just basically around technicians who have facial hair, so as you said, like yourself, and the, the struggles that employers have in, you know, getting their employees to you know, shave the beard or get rid of it. And some of the employees even saying that they would leave if they had to shave their beard off. You know, it's kind of this challenge, really. Would any anything you can help with that? Yeah, this this is um, this is a common uh, challenge. And I mean, personally, as a as a health and safety consultant, I find it very difficult to be able to um, to sort of manage and to monitor because in this day and age, most people, most males anyway, I've got a beard or a, I'm not clean shaven every morning. Well, the HSC, uh, 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 I've got quite a clear stance on it that they should be face fit tested, they should be clean shaven, and if the job that they're doing um, exposes them to dust and chemicals that can cause cancer, that mask has got to be fitted properly, and to get a proper fit, you've got to be clean shaven. Now, there are other options. Um, if it's if it's such a, so difficult, there are like over the hood masks or loose fitting masks that, that don't require face fit testing. You'd have to have a look, go on the HSE's website because there are, you know, air fed masks and other things. There are quite, they are quite expensive, but they don't require a face fit test. But 
yeah, the HSE, they're the people who make the law and the advice, and they're the ones who say, you know, I know someone mentioned AIB and asbestos insulation board before. That, that kills 5,000 people a year. So the people who remove asbestos need tight-fitting face masks that need to be fitted properly and they need to be clean-shaven. If you're dealing with chemicals that can be, you know, hazardous to your health, then again, I hope you're learning. If somebody doesn't want to be clean-shaven and they're essential to the business, look at those loosely fitting masks. Great. And in terms of face fit, someone's asked, do disposable masks need to be checked? Face fitting? Yes, they, yes, they do. So the disposable dust masks, so the FFP3s, tight fitting masks, so not these ones, these mm. will not need face fit testing, but you wouldn't wear them in a circumstance where you protect it against fumes or dust. But yeah, even the, the disposable uh, paper ones with the respirator in, Mm -hmm. need a face fit test and when they do that face fit test on that mask that wearer is only fitted to wear that mask if you buy another make even though it's still disposable they've got to wear that it's they've got to be fitted to that sort of mask mm -hmm. um, i find that the semi-disposable ones are the best they're not always the most practical to wear but if you're going through a lot of disposable masks a semi-disposable one could be used over and over again and could save you a lot of money in the long run but they still need to be face fit tested as well Absolutely. Um, there's, there's a couple of questions regarding um, the availability of PPE, so disposable gloves, etc. And, you know, obviously the prices are going up. Is there, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's kind of a generic statement, I think, but there's, you know, it's, it's you've got to get a habit, you've got to try and get it. Yeah, I mean, going back to, if we're talking about COVID-19, I think this is why the government are more um, concentrating on the more robust. If you think about normal PPE, it's the robust control measures, the social distancing, enhanced because we don't want to be in competition with a lot of you will have to wear PPE for your normal activities and a lot of you will have semi-disposable ones or reusable PPE that you can use over and over again and if, if we if we go away from the fact that we have to use PPE for COVID-19 in all circumstances then we're probably going to have more of a likelihood that we can get all the mm -hmm. semi-disposable ones or the permanent reusable PPE you're probably going to be able to use get all the more better than, than the disposable ones uh, at the moment. Absolutely, good stuff. And then the last question, we're only a couple of minutes over, but I think it's important to get these in here. Um, just the last one, wearing goggles against COVID spread of, uh, of COVID-19, sorry, should, do you recommend that, you know, pest controllers should be wearing goggles? Well, again, going on government guidance, they're not recommending that. They're, um, you know, if, if it makes people feel more comfortable, um, we're going to start going back out on site and what have you now. We've done our risk assessment and we're supplying our consultants with a pack which would have hand sanitizer, wipes, uh, disposable face masks uh, and safety glasses as well. Uh, there's no scientific evidence that it's protecting against that, but it might make people feel a little bit more comfortable. And from a personal perspective, it, 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 it could you know, offer some form of protection, you know, if I use my common sense in in regards to you know it going away from the government guidance but yeah that's what they advise they say social distancing before ppa uh, but it's optional it's not it's not a legal requirement if you decide to use it right risk assessment process good stuff risk assess it yeah the thing is, is you might risk assess they do mention that if you risk assess something because a lot of you may be going out to hospitals carrying out services in hospitals or care homes and it's if it's essential then you might then, because of your risk assessment, say, well, we might look at extra PPE mm. because of the areas and the, the increased risk of the clients that we're going into. Absolutely. Fantastic. Great. Well, Chris, thank you so much. That was very informative. Um, and, yeah, thank you very much for being just uh, Sorry, yeah, you camera in your mute off. Fabulous. Great. So that leads us nicely on to um, Alex Wade, the king of puns, I like to say, um, doing a subject on the lesser of two weevils um so alex yeah if you can get your video on there fantastic unmute yourself and yeah off you go thank you hi everybody yes so very quickly alex wade from palgar international here hopefully you can all see and hear me all right uh just a forewarning i've had a couple of uh connection issues this morning so if i suddenly freeze i'm not doing my best act of a mime i've just disconnected but i will be back very shortly so Today, I'm going to be giving you uh, a little quiz, uh, and all of the quiz questions and answers I've taken from 
this wonderful manual, which you should be able to see. So if you ever want to double check my answers, root that out and you should have a look. So I'm just going to start sharing my screen quickly now. And hopefully you should all be able to see this. Lovely. Yeah, see so that. hopefully we can all see this. So no need for a pen and paper on this quiz. It should be um, all done by automatic polls online. Uh, I think even uh, we should have Scott working diligently in the background now. We even had a test question that we used earlier. Uh, I don't know if you can throw that up, Scott, just so we can all see what we're going to be expecting coming up on our screens. Ah, there we go. Brilliant question. So what did I have for breakfast this morning? Answers, please, guys, so we can see whether or not this is all working. Uh, I'll give you, when we go through this, about 30 seconds to answer the polls, uh, and then we can go over the answers afterwards, or we can go in the, in the end if you so wish. So give you another, let's say, 15 seconds for this so we can actually see whether or not it's working. We can all see it, and it's uh, functioning as it should. So. And there we go. Oh, lovely. No one got it right. Well, actually, 19% of you got it right there. Yes, I clearly had rats for breakfast because that's what we pesties do, isn't it? So moving on. I'm going to have three rounds and we're going to have five questions per round. 30 seconds to answer each question. Now, to explain the names of these things, uh, back in the day, almost... 12 years ago now, when I took my RSPH level two, there's a gentleman on our course who couldn't say the words vertebrates or invertebrates. And so forever have they been known within our uh, little working group down here that uh, vertebrates are furry things and invertebrates are crunchy things. So there we go. And as I said before, all these questions have been taken from the British Pesticide Management Manual, which you can get a copy of from the BPCA. So first things first, first question, I'd like you guys to spot the house mouse out of these four pictures. So A, B, C, or D. And we should have a poll coming up on your screen. Ah, there. So 30 seconds starting now. And if you want, I think I can bring my chat screen up side by side. Oh, I can't. But bonus questions for those on the chat that can actually give the names of the other animals that are not the house mice within there while you are waiting for everyone else to catch up and get their answers. So 10 seconds left. And there we go. So let's see what everyone got. There we go, everyone, almost everyone got the house mouse. Now those uh, 6%, this actually is a wood mouse, uh, Apodemus, and you can tell that uh, if you can see uh, on the screen there, House mouse, they have this wonderfully clear delineation there between top and bottom coats, and usually they'll have a nice little yellow flash. This, of course, is a field vole, which you can tell by the very short tail. And this is a harvest mouse, um, and they are they're absolutely tiny. So next question, I'd like you to name the part that is highlighted on this skull. So have a good look at that now, guys. And what is it? Unfortunately, because we can't track what your scores are, you know, we, we can't, uh, points don't mean prizes in this, but it's a very good practice to be able to know what you're going to be looking at. Okay, 10 seconds left. And there we go. Yes, majority of you got that right. That is the diastema. Uh, so the diastemic gap is um, actually an area where there are no teeth whatsoever. And it's um, crucially important for rodents because uh, their biology means that they are unable to um, vomit. So anything that they chew uh, is only going to, if they swallow it, it's only going to come out one way. So this diastemic gap actually allows rodents to hold uh, chewed material in their mouth. And if they don't wish to swallow it, because they don't wish to swallow uh, wood pulp or other inedible objects, then that's the point in which they decide whether or not it's worth eating or not. So next, which of these is not part of the risk hierarchy or the hierarchy of risk, okay? Give you some options here. 
Okay. So, which of these is not part of the hierarchy of risk? You've got 30 seconds to go for that. Can I point out a spelling uh, mistake there? Uh, you Alex? cannot point out a spelling mistake. No, absolutely not. And no, I now... I just to feel that gap. I just had to do that. Apologies. <laughs> I can't see it. What have I done? Where have I where have I misspelled something? Uh, mon is it carefully placed monitors? It's monitors. Money, money, money. Yeah. Munitions. Munitions. Ah, oh, I've got that word wrong. That's why I read it wrong, haven't I? Let's see. Maybe <laughs> self silly, not you, Alex. <laughs> oh, well, I think we might have given the game away there. Right. So there's your 30 seconds, guys. What if these is not part of the hierarchy of risk? There we go. Carefully placed munitions. So, um, so it's probably my uh, obscure choice of language. Uh, munitions would be explosives. Um, and of course, although hilarious though that would be, uh, there is a special clause under DEFRA that you cannot use explosives specifically to control uh, vermin. So next one. So here's one. And this, this will kind of link back to a couple of other talks we've had today, to, uh, which is when we're establishing LD50 values, which of these four values is actually going to be um, the most toxic? So A, B, C, or D, which of these is the most toxic out of the four choices? Halfway through on your time, guys. There we go. So what did we all say? Be interesting to see this one. There we go. Very good, guys. So with LD50 values, um, you're looking for the smallest number. It's the That is the amount of material required per kilogram in order to kill 50% of a population. So the smaller that number is, the less of it you require. And so the more toxic it will become. So the smaller numbers are more toxic in this case. So finally, the last question on furry things is what a load of blank. So which of these four photos are back droppings? So A, B, C, or D? And uh, while you answer, or after you've answered, I'd like just to see in the chat if you can, the, uh, you know, how you would tell which these are. And I'm looking for two answers here, ideally. I'm looking for um, the one that you tell customers and the one that you tell your uh, apprentices when searching for batch droppings, okay? So about halfway through, A, B, C, or D. There we go. Right. What do we got, guys? D. Yes, correct. Most of you got that right. Usually it's a toss up between um, B and D. Uh, and it's important to note that, yes, bat and mouse droppings do look incredibly similar. Uh, and of course, the two ways you can tell or the, the number one way you can tell is the crumble test. So if you um, pick it up wearing your PPE and you crumble it between your fingers, bat droppings are crumbly because most of the bat's diet is insects. And in fact, if you hold it up to a torch, often it will glitter underneath the light because at that point, it's all of that chitin, and all of that wing casing glittering reflecting. However, if you've got a, a newbie with you, then the number one way of telling the difference is the taste test. You've got to make sure whether or not it dissolves on the tongue or not. Don't let them do this, but it is hilarious. So on to invertebrates now, or crunchy things. So bed bugs, they mate through a process known as traumatic insemination, sad insemination, explosive insemination and gentle insemination. And I promise you one of these is actually the correct definition, um, although they all do sound um, wildly inappropriate. So 30 seconds to go for these guys. Of course, Absolute bonus points if anyone can say um, why they have developed this method of insemination, um, which is radically different from most other insects out there. So there we go. Time's up. 
Let's see what you guys got. Yes, most of you got it, traumatic insemination. So anyone that said traumatic insemination and also managed to point out the fact that um, bed bugs develop traumatic insemination because most insects actually, um, they create a sperm plug. So when they mate, they'll create a sperm plug. And with that, um, the second or third male that comes along, actually, um, as time goes on and evolution uh, progresses, their, their penises actually develop hooks and barbs and scrubs and all kinds of horrible things to actually pull that previous sperm plug out. So it's a bit of an arms race between who can make the best sperm plug and who has the sharpest, nastiest penis. Um, and in this sense, the bed bug actually went entirely the other way. And instead of uh, inseminating by traditional methods, what they did was they, um, they directly insert a scimitar shaped penis through the sidewall or through the body cavity of the bed bugs, bypassing any kind of plugs whatsoever. So just think about that one next time. Okay, so which of these now guys is a metabolic synergist? Is it a chemical which decreases the effectiveness of an insecticide? a chemical which makes an insecticide deposit visible for a short time after treatment, a chemical which increases the effectiveness of an insecticide, or a chemical which sticks, to an, uh, sticks an insect to the floor while the insecticide takes effect. Okay, because I've been talking over that, we'll give you another 20 seconds or so to answer that question. And again, if people are playing, I can't see the chat at the moment, so you're going to have to be playing, and you have to promise me that you're playing along. But if you are, um, bonus points for anyone who can actually give me a name for um, a metabolic synergist that we commonly use um, in our in our day to day jobs. Okay, I think that's it for the time. What did we get? Yes, I feel as though I've lowballed a lot of these questions, guys. I need to. Uh, need to step it up a little bit. But yes, a uh, chemical which increases the effectiveness of an insecticide. And a common one of those that we use is a chemical called piperonyl butoxide, or PBO, as it's often shortened to. Right. Which of these is considered a complete metamorphosis? Is it the movable from egg to larvae to pupae to adult? Or is it egg to nymph to adult? And again, this is a, a very important, um, you know, not a nuanced question, but quite an important thing to understand when you're treating different populations of insects. We'll get onto that in just a moment. So 10 seconds left. And there we have it. Let's see the scores on the doors, please. Yes, that is a complete metamorphosis. And it's important to understand whether or not the insect you're treating goes through these various life stages, um, because it means that your choice of insecticidal active will change depending on what it is. For example, if your pest um, is primarily a pest when it Okay, looks like we might have a connection problem there. I'm not sure if uh, that might just be me or everyone else. Alex, are you are you still there? No, I think we've lost him. I think he'll be back in a second, though. Let's give him a chance to reboot. Indeed, indeed. So just a quick reminder from when uh, when um, Alex is, is done with his presentation, if you've got any questions um, yeah, about insects specifically, I know it's quite a broad subject, um, what he's going through here, but of course, you've got that question section down there, if need be. Um, just for interest, we've got 238 participants with us today. Um, so, yeah, that's a, that's a great number. A few more than we get when we're normally face to face uh, in the different regions around the UK. We normally sort of have 60 or 70 uh, delegates. So, yeah, a really great way to get more people involved. It's fantastic. Um, just while we try to, oh, there's that. Oh, Alex, you're on mute. If you can unmute yourself. There we go. I'm so sorry, guys. I, I said it might happen, um, but. It's fine. Oh. I'm just filling the space. It's fine. You're, you're good with that. Can you get your presentation back up again? I have. And if I can just share it with you guys, then uh, there we go. So jump, we've jumped forwards one there. 
so just need to jump back again. I'm so sorry, guys, but there we go. Back on with it. So which of these is a defining characteristic of flies? They bite as adults, they have two wings, they have a hard wing case, or they're just really annoying. <laughs> so, uh, and I will, I will expect, you know, I will accept the spoof answer for this one as well. But there we go. So 15 seconds left. Well, there we go. Yes, they have two wings. So flies, um, their, their Latin or their, their nomenclature is diptera, which means two-winged. Uh, and they actually have the vestigial remains of the other two wings uh, just behind them. They're called halters. Uh, and they are the same weight and mass as the flies' um, flight wings. And as they flap these halters in um, unison with their regular wings, it allows them to actually hover, fly upside down, or even to land on any surface in any orientation. It's quite a, quite a wonderful adaptation that they have. And they are, of course, really very annoying. So going to get a bit harder now. So which of these four animals is Supella longipalpa? or a brown-banded cockroach. So again, this is, this is uh, probably a bit of an exercise in understanding your binomial normal culture here, um, because two of these species, the, the common names, are often interchanged and often um, used for one another. So we're looking for Sapella longipalpa, which is sometimes called the brown-banded cockroach. Okay, so I think that's time up now. Maybe. Oh, have I disappeared? Oh, my, my poll seems to have frozen. So <laughs> I can say that uh, most people said, oh, there we go. Ah, there we go. Okay, so we've got a bit more of a split this time. Okay, that's interesting. So yes, in fact, the majority of you did get it right. So B is Supella longa palpa. Um, and, you know, you can see it looks very similar to C, which is uh, Germanica, which is the German cockroach. A was a little bit of a, a misleading one. That's sometimes called the smoky brown cockroach, um, but it's Periplanita australialis. And D, uh, some of you guys might see this, uh, but it's not, not a widely found one in the UK, realistically. It is um, Orientalis, or the Oriental cockroach. So there we go. So onto some legal things now, and this should be fun. So the rabbit clearance order is found under which act? Now, I have to point out that within this, um, I, I did double check these from the HSE website. Um, but what I found when I was actually going on the, um, sorry, not the HSE, uh, yes, the HSE website, when I when I was having a look on there, you would be amazed actually um, as to the number of amendments and modifications that happen yearly to almost all of these acts. So it, it's always worth double checking a lot of these, especially if you are using them infrequently, just to make sure that nothing important has changed. So within that, um, the rabbit clearance order is found in which act? The Public Health Act, the Game Act, the Pests Act, or the Dangerous Wild Animals Act? Okay, so time's up. What do we say? Yes, majority of you guys did get that right. It is the Pest Act 1954, which um, highlights the clearance of rabbits from land. Excellent stuff. Next one. If saved by... Oh, hang on. This is a tongue twister. 
If, save as permitted by this Act, any person mutilates, kicks, beats, nails, or otherwise impales, stabs, burns, stones, crushes, drowns, drags, or asphyxiates any wild mammal with the intent to inflict unnecessary suffering, he shall be guilty of an offence under which of these Acts? The Animal Health Act, 1981, the Wild Mammals Protection Act, 1996, the Hunting Act, 2004, or the Air Navigation Order? Again, you'll have 30 seconds for these. So just while you're answering, um, I said I went onto the HSE website. They, they have a fantastic tool where you can actually um, have a, quite a sophisticated search bar at the top where you can search for all of these acts if needs be. And they'll bring them up in order, uh, in order of the original act and then the amendments that happened. And you can have a look at both the original act and also um, specifically the amendments that have happened over time, which is well worth having a visit, especially if you want to brush up on some of these. So what did you guys say for this? Yes, of course, it was the Wild Mammal Protection Act. Um, congratulations to you guys who got that one. Um, the important word to understand in that is to inflict unnecessary suffering um, by offence, because there are some things in here which are open to some interpretation, but we can go over that a little later. If an owner fails to manage an infestation in a timely manner, which piece of legislation can be used to compel that owner and the local authority to take action? Is it the Destruction of Important Animals Act, 1932, Biocidal's Product Directive, Landfield Regulations, 2002, or the Prevention of Damage by Pests Act, 1949? Well, 30 seconds for this. Unfortunately, I can't select the other ones. I can't ask you to give any supplementary questions for this, otherwise it kind of gives the game away on the chat a bit. But um, there we go. So another 10 seconds or so. Get all your answers in. Oh, and there we go. Ah, well done, guys. Yeah, this is a one. <laughs> Yes, 99%. Well done. That 1%, I'm going to assume that you just uh, clicked the wrong box by accident. Um, but yes, this is a wonderful piece of legislation to understand because it gives you a lot of powers um, in order to try and get people uh, to take ownership of infestations and to get the local authorities behind you and on site. So what does COPR stand for? Is it the Control of Pesticides Regulations? The Convention on Product Registrations? Chemicals on public release, or can only poison rodents? As members of the BPCA, you should all, all get this one right. I'm looking at 100% now, guys. Okay, I think that's it. Drum roll. Oh, 98. No. Yes, it is, of course, the control of pesticides regulations. Very, very important bit of um, a legislation that everyone should make it themselves fully aware of going forwards. And the final question of today, I believe, in the BPCO Code of Best Practice for Pesticide Waste, they give a simple hierarchy which states that you should reuse, recycle, dispose, and what other key thing? You should prevent the creation of waste. You should process it by trying to destroy it yourself. Leave it well alone and pass the responsibility on to someone else. Or hide it and just don't let anyone find the waste. Okay, I think I think another 10 seconds should be good because you should all absolutely have this. And I'll be raising an eyebrow if uh, anyone answers D just ahead of time there. There we go. There we go. Yes, you should prevent the creation of waste as best you can. You should try and prevent creating more waste than is necessary uh, to do so. So there we go.
that's the little quiz done for today. Hopefully that was just a, a little bit of break and a little bit of fun for everyone to have within that. Um, if any of these questions are left you feeling stumped or you feel as though you want to point us to some more resources, including manuals, websites or scientific literature or even training online or not, um, then please don't hesitate to contact myself or the BPCA and we can put you into contact um, with some fantastic uh, training tools and uh, educational tools as well. Um, and that's me quite done, guys. So thank you ever so much. Thank you, Alex. That was amazing. Um, we've got a couple of questions here, if you're okay, just to uh, uh, mostly sort of people saying that was great fun and um, a, a great a great way to, to do the presentation because it's really interactive, etc. I certainly think that as well. Um, but just a quick question. So damage by pests that, does it differ in Northern Ireland? Because I have heard of rats and mice destructions at question mark. Um, does the law travel across water and are mainland laws applicable in Northern Ireland? Um, I am going to, sorry, I'm going to err on the side of caution and say that I have not looked at the legislation for Northern Ireland. I apologise. I can't give you an, a, a, an answer for that and it would be remiss of me to take a stab at it. All I can say is if you do go onto the HSE webpage and you search for these um, various acts, um, they do list them by region. So there are certain um, acts uh, and there are certain bits of legislation that, as you say, do differ depending on the region you're in, Scotland, Northern Ireland. So go have a look at that uh, and it will say specifically if there is amendments made to the Act for um, the region that you're within. Great, yeah, it's, it's, it's tricky, isn't it, with uh, the different, you know, Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales, England, um, they can, there can be some differences, but I generally find with legislation such as the um, <clears throat> PDPA or the Prevention of Damage by Pests Act that, yeah, the principles will always remain the same, they might enforce it slightly differently or, you know, the title may be different or the, um, uh, the improvement notices might be a bit different, but generally the same principles usually apply across water, so, um, yeah, but they can... Can be confusing great uh, so lots of compliments on here alex you know about that was a uh, great fun um uh, someone just said some legislation is slightly different in northern ireland one example is a bird uh, derogation act yeah so again just uh there are usually slight differences but the general principles yeah will remain the same um great good thank you alex that was a uh, really good fun as i said and thank you again Okay, so uh, without further ado, then we'll move on to our last speaker of the day. Um, so it is our own CEO, um, Ian Andrew, who will pop his camera on for me now and unmute himself and, and be talking about COVID-19. So an update. I know everybody um, is it's on our minds all the time. And it's something we always want to keep up to date with. So, Ian, thank you. And I'll pass over to you. So, Bert, thanks, Natalie. Yeah, I've got a few words of thanks to say. Um, I've got a few bits and pieces of news, upcoming dates to share, and just a few other bits and pieces around COVID-19 and other, other update stuff. So bear with me. We will finish by 12.30. That I do promise you. I don't want to be standing between you and your sandwich. So a um, few words of thanks. I mean, today, Events like this don't just happen. A lot of effort goes in, both from the BPCA team. And of course, we couldn't do something like this without our sponsor, Baratine, for this morning's event and without our speakers. So thanks especially to Alex from Pelgar for the quiz that we just enjoyed. Chris from Stallard Kane on PPE. Oliver Madge, um, who did this session for, on behalf of Baratine, just around what pest control um, looks like during and as we come out of lockdown. Helen uh, from Bassive on Goliath, Peter from Begone on Honeybees and Sharon from Bassive on Pulse Baiting. So thank you to all of those. And of course, our own Natalie for, for hosting this morning's event and Scott for being technical wizard in the background and Kat's support as well. So thank you all. And thank you to those of you who've taken the morning out uh, to attend. We do appreciate it um, and we hope that it's been useful for you. Um, the, the event is recorded. Um, it will go up on the BPCA website. So if you've got colleagues that couldn't join today or members of your team that you think this would be useful for, it will be available on the BPCA website in time. We just need the people with the ability to put it up to be in the right place with enough broadband bandwidth to make that happen. So uh, bear with us. 
The previous, this is the second forum that we've brought one. The, the recording of the first forum, it hasn't yet made it onto the website, but hopefully forum one and forum two will both go up at the same time sometime soon. Um, the next forum, the date for your diary, 25th of June. So 25th of June for digital forum number three. And it's great that um, we have the level of, of support and interest in, in these events. Um, we've got a couple of other um, things just to make you aware of. We've a couple of new virtual training courses. So these are one day courses. Um, these, they're, they're, they're not freebies. Um, you don't have to pay for these, um, but uh, just so you're aware, one day training courses, it's as if you're in a classroom, but you'll actually be sitting in front of your your laptop. Um, we've got one on understanding genetic resistance and pests that Alex Wade, who just ran the quiz for us, will be running. And we've got a second um, virtual um, course on the principles of pest identification. So look out on the website for details, dates of these two new courses that are coming in your direction. Um, we this week launched a uh, new updated guidance on COVID-19 from a pest control perspective, a uh, document called Becoming COVID Secure. Um, lots of useful guidance. Uh, I hope you've appreciated the guidance and support that the BPCA has endeavoured to put out there on the website throughout this. Um, so we've updated this. A lot of our members, 85% of them, have, have kept doing a level of business throughout lockdown, which is, is great. 15% um, mainly for personal health issues decided not to keep doing the business. But as we edge towards lockdown becoming less severe, particularly in England, um, then there are more members thinking about starting to go back to work. And as we prepare for uh, your clients reopening offices or your clients in time opening, opening restaurants, takeaways, hotels, etc. cetera, um, then we just need to make sure that, that as you go about your business, you do it as safely as possible. So some, some useful guidance, just things to think about, things you have to do, things you ought to do um, as we move towards um, getting back to a degree of normality. So if you go on the website, bpca.org.uk forward slash COVID-19 or one word, and you'll find that document there. Uh, within the document, it's worth no noting that we are in Mental Health Awareness Week. Um, I, I make no apology for highlighting this. It's often something that we, we don't want to speak about openly, but um, lockdown and the effect on business and the effect on family life has taken its toll on people. And so we need to be more aware of, of mental health issues, both for ourselves, our family, and for our teams, uh, whether they're at work or, or not working or on furlough. Um, we need to consider mental health awareness. So there's a lot of resources out there, and please do take the time uh, during Mental Health Awareness Week to, to have a look at those resources uh, and hopefully put some things in place to support yourself, your family and your staff teams as well. Um, gull licensing, I want to quick mention of gull licensing. We've put a survey out to our members just to see how they're getting on with gull licensing in England. Um, anyone that, that's from the other nations of the UK that's got <clears throat> comments or issues around um, their application for GAL licenses, then by all means email us. But the survey, we need some specific data back from you on how you've got on with your GAL license applications this year, um, just so that we can have useful communication back with Natural England and with DEFRA on where we're at. Um, Natural England and Natural Resources Wales and, and Scottish Natural Heritage, they, they're all in a difficult place with, with bird license generally and with gull licenses in particular. Birds are protected. They, they face the legal challenge from, from um, wild justice last year. The chances are there will be further legal challenge in the new licensing system. 
And so they are especially cautious in the, what they are issuing by way of licenses and particularly gull licenses. So if you've received that survey from us this week, it may be last week, but um, can you please get that done as well? Also, we've got um, World Pest Day coming up. It's the 6th of June this year, and we're collecting some videos. So just short 20 second videos. You can take it on your phone. There's some advice again on the website of what we're looking for. But it's a real opportunity to display the professionalism of the sector and just how, as a sector, we've kept other key sectors going. You've been there in supermarkets, in food factories, in schools, in hospitals, keeping them pest free. So just short video um, on the work that you've been doing out there and we'll create a collage of the best videos for um, World Pest Day on the 6th of June. And um, Pelsas have put up, up some prizes for the best videos. So a little incentive uh, for that. I think um, Scott's been putting up some of the links to some of the things I've been speaking about as we've gone through today. Um, so the, lots of things happening. I say my plea to you is just whether you're a member or not a member of the BPCA, um, keep your eye on the website. There's a lot of our resources are for the wider sector, regardless of whether you are a member or not. Um, so the, the, for open access, understandably, some of our resources are for members only and, and they're locked down in, in the members only website, but uh, part of the website. But there's a lot of free resources there. So take the time, have a look, see what we've got on there. I uh, really just want to say thank you again for attending, for making this thing possible. Thanks to our sponsor, Baratine. Thanks to the speakers. And on that basis, unless anyone's got any questions for me, I'm going to call it a day at that. Right. I can't see any have popped up there, Ian. So you must have uh, covered all your subjects again, you know, amazingly uh, thoroughly. So no, no questions um, for you. OK, super. Thanks, everyone. We'll we'll call it a day at that. And thanks again for your time. I appreciate it. Indeed. Thank you, everybody.